The appointed hour of six o'clock having been reached, I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge, and as ZBA Chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access this meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to make sure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Additionally, the meeting recordings will be viewed on the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and the ZBA webpage. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A, and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. We will begin with a roll call of the ZBA members and panel for tonight's meeting. Steve Judge is present. Ms. Parks? Here. Mr. Maxfield? Here. Mr. Meadows? Here. Mr. Gilbert? Present. Also attending the public hearing tonight is Maureen Pollock, planner, and Dave Waskevitz, senior planning, senior building inspector. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting health, safety, convenience, and the general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is Section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all of our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen. The chair, with the assistance of the staff, will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address for the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition is heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20 day appeal, appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in Superior Court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to take effect. Before we begin tonight's agenda, um, when we begin tonight's agenda, uh, we have three items on the agenda, a public hearing, ZBA FY 2023-02, Michael and Tracy Holden requesting a special permit to modify the previously approved special permit ZBA FY 2007-43 to allow the construction of one family detached dwelling as a complementary principal use to the existing two family detached dwelling duplex under sections 3.01, 3.320, 3.3211 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw located at 1147 North Pleasant Street, Map 5C, Parcel 35, Village Center Residence, RVC Zoning District. ZBA FY 2023-03, Fort River Solar 2, LLC, request a special permit to modify the previously approved special permit, ZBA FY 2019-09, for the proposed modification to 
condition 23 and to request a permit extension in order to allow additional time to commence construction beyond the September 12, 2022 expiration under Massachusetts General Laws 40A, Section 9, and Section 10.33 of the Zoning Bylaw, located at 191 West Pomeroy Road, West Pomeroy Lane, Map 19D, Parcel 10, Flood Prone Conservancy District, FPC, Neighborhood Residents, RN, and lot outlying residents RO zoning districts. Following those two items, the ZBA will consider in a public hearing ZBA rules and regulations to review the ZBA rules and regulations in order to bring them into compliance with the Amherst Home Rule Charter and to review other necessary updates, including submission requirements, legal ad fees, and ZBA procedures. After that business, we have a general public comment period during which um, any member of the public can speak to a matter not before the board tonight, uh, other business not anticipated within 48 hours. So before we begin, are there any disclosures on the matters we're going to discuss tonight from the impaneled board members? If not, the first order of business tonight is public hearing on ZBA FY 2023-02, Michael and Tracy Holden, requesting a special permit to modify the previously approved special permit, ZBA FY 2007-43, to allow the construction of a one-family detached dwelling as a complementary principal use to the existing two-family detached dwelling, a duplex, under section 3.01, 3.320, 3.3211, and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw. Located at 1147 North Pleasant Street, Map 5C, Partial 35, Village Center Residence, R, VC Zoning District. Um, the board conducted a site visit on this matter on Tuesday morning. Uh, we walked the site. Uh, we didn't go all the way to the back of the property uh, because it was heavily forested and um, it was very it would be difficult to get all the way back. Um, we reviewed the property lines. We saw both existing units, uh, we, in the interior of both the existing units. We observed the current driveway, its width, uh, what was required under the old, uh, the previously and currently, uh, the previously approved and currently effect, in effect uh, special permit. We looked at where the parking would take place and we observed for the drainage, a rock garden will be located to take care of the drainage from the property. Um, Mr. Gilbert or Ms. Pollock, is there anything else that we should state for the visit? I think that pretty much does it. Um, we have the following submissions regarding this application. The applicant has submitted a special permit application, a management plan, a management plan with additional information required for any residential rental, a complaint response plan, a fixed term lease, site plan for special permit prepared by, by Daniel Sauls dated January 26, 2022, stormwater plan, prepared by Roger Bacon, dated June 16th, 2022, um, A1 through 8, residents, um, uh, so site plans, floor plans, and a general um, uh, view of the property are, are items A1 through A8, also through also A9 and A10, a foundation plan and a street view prepared by the, the uh, applicant. Uh, the existing a floor plan for the existing duplex, uh, a picture for a, a, a sample of the horizontal wood fence, a light fixture spec uh, called re rectangles ADA outdoor wall scouts, and the existing conditions photographs. We also have staff submissions, which include a project application report, a ZBA FY2007-43, FY the special, the current special permit decision that applies to the property, comments from the town engineer dated August 17th, GIS generated maps, a property map, a zoning map, an aerial map, a topography map, and the map of land uses within 500 feet of 1147 North Pleasant Street, which contains 25 single family homes and 12 two family homes plus a hospice and 96 condos. We also have public comment from uh, Derek and Natalie Shea at 31 Harris Street. I think that's all the submissions concerning this application. 
Okay. Um, who is going to appear for the applicant tonight? Mr. Holden? I am. Yes, could you state your name and address for the record? Uh, Michael Holden, and I reside at 1147 North Pleasant Street in Amherst. Okay, run. You can. This is your chance to run through the application and uh, to talk about what you're asking the board to approve. Uh, so my proposal is to construct a owner-occupied single-family home on the existing property on the rear portion. Um, we purchased the property uh, 15 years ago. Uh, there was an existing structure on it that was mixed use. Uh, I think it was zoned. Um, commercial or business at the time, there was a doctor's office operating out of it prior to our purchase. Um, and there was the evidence of two used apartment, two apartments uh, in the house, one in the rear and one upstairs that I believe the doctor used. Um, when we purchased the house, we filed special permit application to legally divide it into two apartments to make it a duplex, um, non-owner occupied uh, two family house, which we did uh, 15 years ago, um, and have rented out ever since then. My family moved to Amherst. Well, we made the decision to move my family to Amherst, uh, back in September. Um, so I can enroll my kids in the Amherst school system. Uh, I've got two kids that just started high school today and one that uh, started fifth grade today. Um, we've made the decision after moving into the house that, uh, we absolutely loved our change and moved to Amherst and wanted to remain in Amherst long term. Um, so we were looking for an opportunity to do so. And since we already own the property, uh, the lot um, was, it's a fairly large lot for the area. Um, just, I think it's 0 0.71 acres, uh, has enough area as far as the zoning um, requirements are concerned for village center residential to build another structure if approved as a special permit. Uh, so it seemed like a perfect opportunity for us to build a to build our single family home on the existing property uh, with the existing duplex, um, be able to maintain the the non owner occupied duplex. It's currently owner occupied because we're living in it, but I would go back to renting it out and then live on site in the single family dwelling in the rear portion of the property. So that's the that's a gist of uh, the proposed project. Um, I guess as far as uh, why I think it's just, I'm sorry, yeah, why, tell, tell us why you think it's appropriate, and then just run briefly through what your plans for the house are. If you want to share the, um, I think Maureen has the drawings. If you wish to go through the drawings as well, yeah. If uh, not being not being skilled at screen sharing and Zoom meetings. Sure, uh, just, Marine uh, give me meeting. one second. That is, it, and while you do that, Maureen, I failed to mention that we did receive a letter from the planning board, oh, yeah, um, thank you. which um, they reviewed this project. They have no, um, they had no opinion, uh, no negative opinion of the project. They did suggest that uh, one condition is that it, that the new residence be owner occupied, but that's the only. Um, uh, suggestion coming from the um, planning board. I think they approved, they did not disapprove the project. I don't know what their process is, but it was a, um, a satisfactory uh, result. Let me pull up, let me pull up their mem their memo. Yep. I, I have that. Do you have that exact one? Yes, let's see here. So we can, so this is the memo from Christine yep. Brestrup on behalf of the Amherst planning board says, Dear Mr. Judge, at its August 17th, 2022 meeting, the Amherst Planning Board heard a presentation from Michael Holden about his request for the special permit for the proposed construction of a single family house on a property that already contains a duplex at uh, 1147 North Pleasant Street. The presentation was generally well received by the Planning Board. After hearing the presentation and discussing the project, the Planning Board recommended if the Zoning Board of Appeals approve the special permit that there be a condition requiring owner occupancy of the property. Thank you. Yeah, so I wanna make it clear that this um, proposal is to, is to build an owner occupied 
dwelling unit um, that mm -hmm. I'm not looking to add apartment units. Uh, the property was already approved for the non-owner occupied duplex in the front. And this is an opportunity to build a owner occupied uh, home on the property. Um, getting into why I think it's, it's actually in my mind, it's the perfect uh, project for the, for this property. Um, it's village center residential. Um, when the master plan, the new master plan was put in place, um, there was a goal to densify uh, the village center residential appropriately, obviously, but uh, to increase density in that area. Um, in the 15 years that I've owned that owned that property, um, it has clearly uh, the neighborhood as a whole has clearly steered more towards non-owner occupied rental units. Um, four houses directly to the south of me, two of which abut my property, uh, which were at the time I bought the property owner occupied, have since become non-owner occupied rental units. Um, and then the two properties uh, further south on North Pleasant Street also became non-owner owner occupied since I purchased the home. So there's clearly been an increase of non-owner occupied homes in the area. Um, and I understand uh, concern from residents that are owner occupied homes in the area, especially on Harris Street. I did read the public comments um, that were submitted by Derek and Natalie Shea. Um, so I want to make it clear to them that this is to be an owner occupied property. I think their concern centered around the idea that there was going to be an expansion of rental property in the neighborhood. And I just want to clarify that it's not. Um, when talking to the zoning board, one of the things we talked about was uh, the requirement for there being an owner occupied um, dwelling unit on the property. Um, one of the zoning board members, I'm planning sorry, board. planning board members, um, made reference to down the road should my kids all be moved out of the house through college and moved on and we choose to downsize uh, that we would have the option of moving into one of the two units in the in the front duplex um, which seemed reasonable we are certainly um, op accepting of the requirement to have an owner occupied dwelling unit on the property um, so as far as the neighborhood goes, I feel like building an owner occupied single family house on that rear portion of the property, which is the portion of the property that abuts the other owner occupied single family homes. Um, we'd actually be strengthening the property and protecting the abutting neighbors in a way in the rear um, because it would be occupied by a family, um, the owners of the property. And obviously I would take a great vested interest in the property and maintaining it um and protecting the abutting properties did you want to walk them through your your submitted materials yeah sure so what we're seeing here i'm gonna let you scroll through maureen mm -hmm. okay so what we're seeing here is the site plan we had the property surveyed um the proposed home like i said the property has uh more than enough area uh to build the proposed home that we that we submitted um, there's a very minor expansion of the existing parking area, um, which you can see as proposed asphalt, uh, which basically just gives would give us two more parking places and a drive driveway access into the proposed garage. Um, the garage would be street facing. Uh, a couple of reasons for that, um, being that it was going to be our our residents. Um, I was looking for a little bit of a buffer between um, our home and North Pleasant Street, which is a high traffic area. Um, so we put the garage, obviously, for ease of access, but also as a slight buffer to, to North Pleasant Street. Um, the house is south facing. So while the front, what would be considered the front side of the house with the porch, uh, faces the side yard, it is directly south facing. Um, which is which that side of the house as we go into the plans you'll see has more windows uh more light area on the front side of the house and we are also looking to do photovoltaic on the house um so we want to situate the roof lines uh appropriately the next page is the stormwater management plan that was uh provided by roger bacon engineer um, which was uh, sent to the town engineer and the notes came back on it saying that the calculations were adequate to handle uh, the new impervious surface runoff. 
And so can you walk them through explaining what is the what that is? Yeah. So you see the existing proposed house. There's a uh basically a a small swale um that would pick up any water along the east and south side of the property um as it grades down that way and then go to a rock rain garden um which would fall directly uh alongside of the parking area my intention would be to put a um a small berm along the east side um with plantings uh for screening um on the on the east side of the swale um and then allow any water water runoff to go to that rock garden there all right next one so that's a proposed home um fairly simple uh call it a modern farmhouse style colonial layout um keeping it simple um clean aesthetics uh, I think it fits in well with the neighborhood and the property there's uh, our the existing duplex is a Greek revival that was built in 1835 um I didn't as far as finding uh, architecture that would fit in with the neighborhood in the existing home um I felt like keeping it a fairly simple style um would mesh with the existing neighborhood across the street is a very large colonial uh there's uh, another couple of Greek revivals in the area um primarily white homes um uh, another bit of the story is that when we purchased the property there was a barn uh more closely uh, tied to the house is actually uh slightly connected to the back side of the house but um it was dilapidated when we bought the property and we ended up getting an emergency demolition permit to take it down um but i always had in mind that there would be some sort of a structure barn like structure in the back of that property and i felt like putting the garage facing the street which is the primary street view um, would be looking up the driveway through the parking area at the garage um would kind of give it the the feel that the garage actually may belong to the front house and the house itself which sits mostly behind the garage is a little bit more discreet uh, from the street view there's another aerial view showing the parking proposed parking area the layout of the house um, with a stone patio in the back also showing proposed screening um and that included the six foot privacy fence that i would like to install on the north side since that's going to be our uh, primary uh, outdoor area with our patio and i will add that the property that abuts that area um, is property that belongs um, to the fisher home hospice home and that entire section uh to the north of the house area is is wooded and um actually gives a pretty good buffer between our property and the and the fisher home and this is the layout first floor layout um basically set up for fl first floor living with a master suite um open concept in the main living area um with additional bedrooms on the second floor and bathrooms. But the idea was that it had first floor living. Uh, so if I'm still living there in 20, 25 years, then I'd have the ability to live on the first floor. And second floor plan, uh, it's four, designed as a four bedroom home with uh, three and a half bathrooms. As I said, I've got a family of five with three kids um, all in school right now. I've got one that will be graduating in a couple of years, but I expect she'll be around uh, quite a bit for a while. And I've got two uh, two younger children, one in, uh, and who, like I said, just entered fifth grade. So he'll be around for a while. So we want to give our kids adequate space. Front view of the home from the south elevation. North elevation. We get the east elevation should be the back side of the property and the west elevation from the street view the basement plan and there's more accurate street view that's the existing layout when i submitted uh permit application special permit application for the existing home uh that was what i provided as floor layout so can and you distinguish you saw, between unit one and two 
Yeah, so there's a clear, uh, basically where the port to the right side of the porch, there's a line that goes through that uh, separates uh, with a full firewall from roof deck all the way down to slab um, between the two units. The front unit is a two story. I think you'll see on the next page, the second floor. Uh, the, the back unit is a single story, two bedroom. So there's four bedrooms in the front unit. Four bedrooms in the front. The uh, we're currently using what is listed there as bedroom one, as because um we're a family, uh, and we wanted a bigger living living area. Uh, we chose to use what's labeled as the living room as a dining room, and uh, what's listed as bedroom one as our living room, which is also shared by my ten year old son, uh, much to his chagrin, um, <laughs> as a bedroom. Uh, proposed um, stock photo of what type of fencing I'd be looking for for privacy fencing on the back side of my uh, patio area of the house. Uh, downcast lighting, um, just dark, dark sky compliant. And that's the existing, that's the east elevation of the existing home. Uh, street view of the existing home. And that would be the south elevation of the existing home. Another street view. That's it. Yep. Okay. Great. Anything else, Mr. Holden, before we uh, go to questions from the board? Um, no, I mean, I'm certainly looking forward to hearing what questions you have. Um, but I just want to reiterate that, um, you know, for us, this is a uh, this is a long-term investment in the neighborhood and that by investment, I mean, for our family, um, uh, when we made the decision to move to Amherst, uh, we wanted to improve opportunities for our children. And, uh, since living in the house since, since September, my kids have fallen in love with the town. They've fallen in love with the neighborhood. Um, we have a bus stop directly in front of our house. Uh, my 10 year old can, can ride his bike over to the mill river, um, playground area where they just put in new basketball courts. Um, my daughter, uh, my oldest daughter, who's going to be, a, who's just started her junior year at um, Amherst Regional, uh, came in last year as a varsity pitcher. Um, she's an athlete and uh, we go over to the Mill River um, and use their batting cages over there so she can practice hitting and pitching. Um, we've just completely fallen in love with it. My oldest daughter actually got a job at Amherst House of Pizza because she could walk to work from there as well. So it's kind of an ideal, ideal setting for our family at this point. And um, I did speak to the uh, a neighbor across the street who I'm quite friendly with on um, the Parkers. And she had mentioned how nice it was to see a family back in the house and um, getting picked up by the school bus in the morning and dropped off in the afternoon. And um, that's what we've really liked about it is uh, feeling safe in a neighborhood. I know there's a, a large population of college students there and some residents have, take issue with the number of college students, um, but we actually, find it, uh, I don't know, a little more vitalizing. I think just being in a vibrant neighborhood um, where there's stuff going on. We moved from the woods. I was living, we were living in the woods up in, in Barnardston um, on a larger amount of acreage. And I always thought when we moved up there, when I built my house there 16 years ago, that it was kind of an ideal setting for to raise kids. And then realized that I had the luxury as a child of living in a neighborhood um, and I guess I took that for granted because when we moved up to the woods, my kids complained about not being close to friends and being able to go down the street to their friend's house. And so one of the things that we've really liked is that our kids have friends in the immediate area that they can walk to and ride their bikes to. Um, so again, I'm, we're looking at this as a, as a long-term thing. Uh, we love Amherst. I've actually worked in, I know Dave Wiskevitz, who I see on this call uh, quite well. I've done a lot of work in the Amherst area. Um, so to speak to the quality of the house that I'll be building a little bit. Um, Dave's familiar with a lot of my projects. Uh, more recently, I did the home at 16 Eames Ave, uh, which abuts um, East Pleasant Street. Uh, it was a major renovation, addition, new garage. Um, the focus of my work over the last at least 10 years in the Amherst area has been deep energy retrofits, um, net zero homes primarily. Um, I did one on Beston Street uh, a few years back, um, 20 Beston. Uh, I did the, one of my big kickoff projects in Amherst was 82 Cottage Street. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it by address, but 
Uh, it belongs to Sarah and Gareth Ross. And that was uh, essentially a full teardown that we rebuilt. And it's a net zero home, um, modern style, uh, three floor house. Um, and that was working with Coleman Hartman Architects. And I basically did a project with them every year for several years, a major project in the area. So I could show, I could easily show you six or seven homes that I've uh, done just in that immediate area neighborhood um, closer to town. And this is gonna be a quality home going in. It's gonna be double stud walls, dense packed cellulose, um, super insulated, triple glazed windows, um, all electric. Uh, I also raise a point that, um, you know, I'm looking to build a clean air home for my family. I've got two kids with asthma. And so I'm looking to do an all electric clean air home. Um, so it's going to be super insulated, super tight. Um, and I think we'll bring a lot of value to the neighborhood. Mr. Holden, uh, you're in the business. And so, you know, there's going to be, you need to have much more detail when you get to building plans, but right now what's, when I look at this, my first question is what's the siding going to be and, and what's it going to look like? Uh, Cause there's no indicate it's a white, just a white. Yeah. Uh, blank, um, so blank canvas first, right now. first to speak to some of the lack of detail is there, there's still yeah. a lot of time invested in that plan. Uh, yeah. Know, even though it's somewhat simple. Um, but until I knew that we could move forward with this, um, I, you know, at this point I've already, I had already sent it out for structural um, to have all the structural calculations done on it. Um, as I get into providing finished details on it to submit for permit. Um, our, right. our plan is to primarily side the house in a bore in Boral. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but that it's cement? a fly ash and resin uh, manufactured product. It recycles fly ash and um, it basically lasts forever. Um, it uh, holds paint cuts and looks like wood. Um, and so it will look like a, a wood sided house, um, but will be made with a product uh, that uses recycled material and will also last forever and not have to be recited and, and uh, easy maintenance. Um, and we're planning on doing what they call a nickel gap. Um, similar to, I don't know if you've seen the house at um, 16 Eames Ave, uh, which is the house, if you're looking, if you know where Eames Ave cuts in, it's a private dirt road that cuts in off of East Pleasant Street. Um, mm -hmm. And it fade, the house faces uh, East Pleasant Street on the left-hand side of Eames Ave. It's, they ended up um, painting it a dark, I think it's called iron ore, a dark gray. Um, but the boarding itself on the front part of the house that, or the part closer to Eames Ave is a nickel gap um, bore all product. So it basically looks like barn board, um, okay. but cleaner looking, uh, much cleaner looking, cleaner lines and nickel gap because of space between creates a, a space of uh, a, a look of barn board where it has the nickel space between the boards, but um, looks much more cl cleaner and more modern than rustic barn board. And how about the roof? Is it a metal roof or is it? Are you uh, so it's, a, it's actually, it? we were planning on doing a mix. Um, I don't like putting uh, photovoltaic on, on asphalt roofs. Um, I always like to have a metal roof put on if I'm going to do photovoltaic. So the garage, the main garage roof and the main house roof will be metal. Um, and then the lower roof lines uh, will most likely be asphalt just to mix it a little bit. Okay. Um, speak to me, uh, just speak to the area to the, I guess it would be the east of the house um, where um, you, as you, you said it's a grass swale and then it goes to the property lines. Uh, just talk about the, that. We didn't get to walk that area. It's very densely forested or yeah there's a lot of low that, growth so there's actually only a few a lot trees. of lot of are you gonna okay are you gonna clear cut that or are you gonna leave it to some trees on the on the border uh talk about so that. it's gonna require us clear cutting um because with that said the 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 actual trees um are pretty much center in that area um there's a couple very large butternuts um the largest tree in that whole in that whole piece of property is actually very unhealthy and needs to be taken down before it falls it's already mm -hmm. split at the base. It's a double trunk tree that's already split. And from my experience being at that property in the past, uh, we've had butternuts come down back there on our property and the property to the south of us. Um, and those are very large trees and can do damage when they come down. Um, so there's one, the largest tree on that portion needs to come down anyway. Um, there's a somewhat smaller butternut uh, a little bit further to the east 
Um, and then there's a couple other smaller trees. But basically, now, they, but Mr. Holden, I, I understand that they have to come down on the, the footprint of the property. I'm really just interested in the in the back beyond the property that back. Yeah, um, so I guess that's what I'm getting feet. at. Is any any yeah. of the larger trees are more in the center, and then anything towards the back. Um, if there's anything of value, again, it's kind of hard to see clearly right. um, where the trees are located in relationship to the property line. I will say that we own the the majority of the property to the point that it is wooded or grown in. Uh, the people, I believe, in the abutting property have, for the most part, cleared to the property line. But again, it's a little hard to see back there. Um, if there's any trees of value that we don't feel will put our house, the new structure at risk with the construction of falling, mm -hmm. um, then we would certainly want to leave them. I just obviously can't leave anything that within, you know, uh, so many feet of digging a foundation hole. Um, where there might be damage to roots and then eventually they would have to be taken out which would be much more difficult to do after a house was in place what i'm guessing is that most of with the proposed arborvitaes you believe that you're going to need a screen to, from the neighbors onto the yeah east. i would imagine yeah, that's so what you're looking at pictures okay. if i can actually find a, if i can test out my ability to screen share um no. I took some pictures of when I was able in early spring before it was too grown in to be able to walk in the property. Um, I took some pictures basically from the property lines um, to show what the view was from those areas and where the concern would be about the possible need for, for screening. Mm -hmm. And those two places primarily were um, that bat, that east property line because once that's cleared out, it does open up to the abutting neighbor's property substantially um yep. and i think both for us and for them uh it would be good to have added screening across that whole section um so it would give them a replacement of screening that they've had you know with the grown in area um it would just be new plannings and then it would also give us privacy in our home okay um I have other questions, but I, I'd like to open it up to other members of the board if they have questions. Okay. Ms. Parks. Um, so currently you're living in one, uh, in the four bedroom portion of the house. Are you renting the other portion? Are there two people renting the second part of the house? There are. Okay, and so when you build the house, are you intending to have six people in the uh, front house total? Uh, there would be the possibility, I'm sorry, there would be the possibility of four tenants in the front house, the, the four bedroom apartment, and two tenants in the rear apartment, which is what the original special permit was approved for, uh, what we've had uh, for the majority of the time that we've owned the house. There may have been a couple of times when there were only three tenants in the front. Um, we actually, in the first, I think, five years that we owned the home, we had a woman living in the back apartment that had two children that shared a bedroom when they were very young. Um, and then she was fortunately able to buy a home in Amherst and has continued to live in Amherst uh, with her kids who went through the Amherst school system. Um, so we've had a mix of tenants over the years, but I would like to leave the option open to have four tenants in the front house and two in the back, the back apartment. All right. Um, I wasn't able to go on the site visit. Is there parking for six uh, six vehicles for the front house? Yeah, there currently is. Um, it's almost never used. Uh, we, with my family living in the front, we only have two vehicles between us. Um, and then with the two tenants in the rear apartment, only one of them has a car. So there's only actually ever only three cars there. I've never in the 15 years we've owned the home had a problem with having adequate parking. One of the things um, students who've lived there have loved is there's literally a, a bus stop directly across the street from the house. So it's always been attractive to students who don't have who don't have homes when we've had students living in the house. But currently don't there's have five cars. Parking. I'm sorry, don't have cars. But currently there's five parking spaces per permitted on the property right now. Uh, there's delineated six. on the property. Yeah, there I'm sorry. There were six, six. There were six permitted based on the original special permit. Um, the we didn't do anything with repaving the driveway or parking area when we purchased the house and did the separation into two units. Um, so I think technically we were permitted to have six, but.
but it really because of the layout even though there's the depth um to have six cars the layout and the shape of the parking areas as it is now is more adequate to five um right. but with the minor expansion of the proposed parking area it would then make it uh five six seven parking places total and plus what's in the garage is plus right? two yeah two bay garage correct okay so we're talking a total of nine parking spaces for the property correct okay okay um other questions i have one um there's no you've had this property rented for a while there's no rental permit on this property can you explain why that is um nothing nothing with the town of amherst and one of the conditions that we have is that you need to have the rental property registered with the town of amherst so yeah. uh, can you speak to that for us yeah I, I mean all i can do is i guess apologize that was an oversight i i guess it had been some time um honestly i don't know what the I know that I can go online and do it. Um, I think if there was some way, I don't know, I don't recall ever getting a reminder from the town of Amherst or something in an email or a letter um, to do it. If we if we did, um, I, I, I think I remember several years ago getting a notice. Um, honestly, I just think it was an oversight on our part. And for that, I, I apologize. Um, we certainly don't have an issue doing it. Uh, I think it was just one of those things that fell off the radar because I didn't have a reminder in front of me. All right. So as a condition, we generally, in this case, we certainly would require rental re registration for the rental property. Yeah. Um, then on the, the one area that I, I thought there might be insufficient screening was where at the parking where you, those trees are, um, I'm not sure that they provide the kind of screening that may be the best for those neighbors. I'm, I don't know if they haven't spoken up, but it's, um, is there a possibility of putting some lower shrubs that would grow up for the, the three, four feet to screen for the my parking area on that um, on the north side of the property where you see the ex exist existing trees? Um, I can see where the fence does a good job of screening you, but the existing pine trees aren't particularly thick down at the at, at the height of the of the car headlights. So yeah. Would you be so interested in? And um, open to putting some kind of shrubbery there to, or something there to, to um, reduce the uh, light trespass onto that property from car lights. So yeah, yes, absolutely open to that. Um, not being a tree expert, or right. uh, I don't know what would best suit growing under a large pine tree. Um, yep. Certainly open to recommendations for what type of plantings would would thrive underneath uh, large pine trees that drop a lot of pine needles and pine cones and sap um, and provide quite and a bit sh of shade over that area. Shade. Yeah. Well, the other possibility is a, is, a, is a screen of some sort too. Yeah, uh, that's fine. A, I will say if I, if I might, that um, there has never been an issue with uh, car headlights with the abutting property. The, um, the people that live in that home, so it's a two family, there's an apartment in the back. Um, are, when cars pull into that parking area, they're not actually shining directly at at that home. Uh, they have, uh, I'd, I'd say half of that space in the back is yard and then it kind of turns into a grown wooded area. Um, there's never been any issues with it. I will say their parking area um, with those existing maple trees probably uh, causes more light cast on our pocket directly into bedroom windows on that side of the house than our parking area ever would. That's not saying I'm not open to screening it off, but I can just say from the time that I've owned the house, that's never been an issue. Okay, thank you. Um, those are the questions I have. How about uh, questions from other members of the, the board regarding this application? Oh, a, a quick question. Where do you, um, I did have other questions I noted here. Um, currently, so you're planning to have the trash and recycling for the new hop, the new structure in the garage. What right. about trash and recycling? Where is it, where is it currently um, housed or 
So it's currently Where's housed it? on the back edge of the parking area in front of those pine trees. Right. It actually moved a couple times over the years because when we originally uh, separated into uh, a duplex and hired, I believe at the time it was Amherst Trucking when they were in existence that was doing the trash removal. Um, the contract I had with them was that they would actually drive into the driveway. And then at some point um, they stopped while we weren't living in the home, stopped driving into the driveway to pick up trash and required it to be brought out to street side. Um, and at some point, I believe tenants moved it forward. Um, I've since returned it to the back parking area. Um, I understand there may be a need for screening uh, for those trash cans, but it is in the rear portion of the property. So I'll I'm not sure. We, I'm not sure we need screening for it, but I think there should be provision in there saying that it'll be kept back from the street, so it's not. Yeah. They're not trash cans aren't left out on the streetscape out in front. Yeah. Um, so there, you know, your management plan could be amended just to say that the the trash can for their existing building are kept behind the the, the front house. Okay, perfect. Okay, yep. that would be that would satisfy my concern. Okay. Um, and lastly, where do where are you going to pile snow in this in the winter? So prior to the home being built, uh, the way it's being plowed now is the snow is being pushed um, for the most part. To that rear east side of the parking area which then would put it in my driveway and on the walkway um now depending on if i'm being asked to put in additional shrubbery or screening um along those pine trees i would think that pushing snow off um to the north north and northeast side of that parking area behind the corner of the garage would make the most sense given that's yep. where the most space is but that might be affected by if I were to need to put in any kind of fencing or, or plannings there. Yeah. And where does that, when it melts, does that go back to, will that get picked up by the, uh, the drainage system or is that going to go? Well, for the, the most of that is already existing in permeable surface. Yeah. So it, you know, it, it melts off to the side. There is some um, runoff yeah. down, down the driveway because it does slope down towards the road. There is a storm drain directly in front of our house in the um, in the tree belt. Yep. Um, so there is that. obviously some water runoff towards the front of the house, but the um, the new if we were to push snow actually to the northeast corner of the parking area, it would probably do a better job of just going back into the the land there because that's a very heavily grown in area um, just above that, um, and I don't see any issue with water uh, getting into the ground there. Right, and it's the um, property is higher in the back and lower in the front, and it would probably run onto the as if it runs on the asphalt, it's going to go into your rain garden, so or your rock rain garden. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, the last question is is much like Miss uh, similar to what Miss Parks talked about. Um, are you comfortable having a limit of four on in tenants in front and two? unrelated tenants in the back unit? Oh, absolutely. In the front part of okay. the house, the way the, way the uh, yep. special permit's written now? Yep. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so that would seem to be a, a condition that we can uh, apply. And then lastly, we need to get some thought from you about um, the limitations on, on uh, guest stay and the number of guests on the property, the rental property. Yeah, so, so right I now, did, sorry. Yep. Go ahead. What, tell us what numbers you're comfortable with. We tend to, you know, um, want to have a limit on the total number of people for an event at the uh, on the property, just because of neighbors' concerns. So if you yeah, can speak absolutely. to that and speak to guests, overnight guests. So I I believe, and I it's kind of piled up the papers here, but I believe my the my uh, lease is worded that there's no more, and this is uh, the lease per unit, um, no more than eight people allowed on the property at any given time. Um, that was sort of a general condition uh, that mm -hmm. was written in for any apartment. Um, and then I read the uh, in one of the documents that was um, posted online where that meant that there was a total of 16 people allowed on the property for the front house, assuming that both apartments had eight people at any given time, um, which sounds excessive. Um, I can tell you that has never happened and I don't see that ever happening, that the 
that there would ever be an incident where the tenants in the front had eight people over uh, or had eight people on, on site and the rear apartment had eight people. Um, I don't know how to write that into the lease to make that number any smaller. I mean, when you have an apartment with uh, four people living in it, potentially, the idea was that if they each had a friend over, um, mm -hmm. you've got eight people on site. And I think yep. that's very reasonable. Um, with the back apartment, uh, you know, to restrict them to one additional person per tenant seems unreasonable to say that they can never have more than four people on site at any given time. Um, so if the board was comfortable with it, I would prefer to keep it the way it's written as far as eight people per apartment um, on site at any given time. Um, given the fact that I am going to be living on site mm -hmm. and I going to hold them to very high standards as far as what activity occurs on, on the property. You know, owner occupant. Yep. Exactly. And then how are you comfortable with this? seven days um how long for guests to be overnight yeah so that was written in there um really to avoid somebody having somebody sort of like move in short term right. without, without my knowing um yep. and so seven nights seem reasonable if they had a friend visiting from out of town that they could stay okay. over for up to a week um if they had a friend visiting from out of town that might be in town for two weeks and i just would be requiring them to ask me if that was okay so at least i was aware they were on site all right and, and we tend so, to go ahead morning so what what how many people though so you said the seven consecutive days so the maximum number of overnight visitors per unit shall be how many people with the maximum i mean i guess honestly i've never like, thought about adding that into the wording of the lease if you have a recommendation or anybody on the board has a recommendation i'm certainly open to it in the past, we typically want to defer to the to what the land the the landowner is comfortable with, unless it's outrageous. But it seems to me to be that if you had a, a limitation for overnight guests of seven days, a limit to the number of people, uh, doubling the number of people in the unit makes sense. So one per tenant. So if you, I'm sure we could find a way to write that into the lease, or we could certainly put that in the conditions. Um, but there'd be four no, no more than four overnight guests in the front and no more than two overnight guests in the back and for a limited total of seven days and if you're comfortable with that we'll put it in the conditions and then you'll have to reflect that in the least yeah that's the least. Yeah, i'm very okay. comfortable with that yeah. all right seven days one per tenant okay all right miss parks um, so I'm looking at the letter from uh, Jason Scales that says there's no plan showing the water or sewer, sewer utility connections. Um, and I'm wondering at this point, do we need to see this? Is this something that needs to be a part of whatever we could uh, approve or not? You know, Ms. Parks, I think that in the case of this, if we impose a requirement that says that before a building permit would be issued, this has to be um, provided to the town, to the building department, and they have to approve it as well as the public works department has to approve the connection. As long as we make that a condition, I think that we okay. probably don't need to see it ourselves. But um, I, I'm confident that they will require city water and sewer before the before a construction permit would be um, um, uh, given. And approve. Okay, I I was just concerned that, you know that 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 those conditions would be in there since this the, it also says that the property may not be built in two years. You um there's I thought there was something about maybe an extension. Not for this one. He has two years. He has two years from the to complete this to substantially complete it. Okay. Typically, I think the extension is for our next one. Okay. I know there's an issue on the extension on the next one, but I haven't, I don't remember that there's a condition here. Typically, the building has to be done uh, substantially completed within two years of the permit being approved. Okay. And is that your plan, Mr. Holden? Yeah, I certainly, that, that requires hiring uh, an engineer uh, to do. And so obviously not knowing if this was something that was going to, that was going to move forward. I was obviously trying to keep um, out-of-pocket expenses somewhat restricted before going through this process um 
and certainly that would be the once approved if if approved that would be one of the first things i would do would be to uh, get an engineer on board to do the drawing for the water and sewer tie-in okay okay um mr judge yeah. uh, i just wanted to clarify so the permit is valid um if approved um the applicant would need to start uh commencement of the construction within two years of it being filed with the town clerk so uh, start just wanted, okay yeah to start construction All right. not complete but to start construction okay thank Correct. you maureen um i have no other questions at this time any other board member if not we'll open it up to um the public if they have if there are any public comment if member of the public wishes to comment, please uh, raise your hand. I think we have one. Uh, when recognized, please give your name and address for the record, and then let us uh, and then give your comment and try to keep it to around three or four minutes. It looks like we have somebody there. Hi, my name is Jessica Mix Barrington. I live at Thirty Nine Pine Street. Um, this is the second time in 15 years that I've commented on Mr. Holden's plans for 1147 North Pleasant. Uh, too bad that uh, 15 years ago, he didn't retain the single family house um, zoning or that was on the house already. Then he could easily build his accessory dwelling with no problem. Um, however, I have two concerns. Um, I don't know that the uh, picture that was shown of the house plans um, is in any way reflective of reality, um, but I would like to point out that the homes on North Pleasant Street um, and around the corner onto Pine um, and down a bit are in a National Historic District. The homes on North Pleasant Street are all colonial or Greek revival, as Mr. Holden said, and they are all clabbered and they are, have windows that are, have panes in, divided into panes. Um, I would like to see the style, the exterior style of this house reflect the architectural qualities of the other houses immediately around the proposed dwelling. I would also like to say that, and I don't know if this is possible, um, if it's not possible, then I'm against this uh, variance, uh, but if it is possible, I would like the property to be forever designated owner occupied, that there always has to be an owner on that property in order to make it a legal uh, holding. There's, because we're going backwards here, um, going from a duplex to a single family home, instead of following the uh, zoning requirements of having a single family home where you, uh, that is owner occupied and then putting an accessory dwelling on it, on the property if the person wants to, um, there's no there's no owner occupied requirement um, that I know, can understand um, on this property, and I would like to see that made part of uh, the variance so that from here until eternity, this is an owner occupied required property. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barrington. Um, we have one. Do we have other com comments from the public? Um, Kathleen Carroll. I think you're muted, Ms. Carroll. Uh, Ms. Um, Ms. Carroll. Um, you take your mute off. You're currently muted, and we can't okay. hear you. All right, hold on. We hear you now. There you go. We got you now. Now we got you. Okay. All so right. I'm state Catherine. your name, name and address for the record, please. 
Kathleen Carroll, 11 Fisher Street. I have um, a couple of questions. And one of them is, is the new building going to have its own property line? And is it going to be a separate piece of property that can be split um, uh, apart from the front building? Uh, just thinking out of the box that perhaps down the road, the two buildings would be separated and sold separately. Um, and are they going to be titled separately? Are they going to be taxed separately? How does that work? That is a couple one a couple of questions I have. The other question is, is the new building going to be titled in the LLC? And what type of homeowner's insurance uh, is going to be on the property? Is it going to be owner occupied or is it going to be tenant occupied? And what kind of homeowners and uh, policy is on the front building currently? And that building is currently titled in an LLC. Is that correct? Okay, thank you. Uh, um... Do you have other comments, Ms. Carroll? Uh, we'll give the applicant a chance to respond in, to all the questions at one time. So they're not I, gonna respond to you directly in this time. Okay, I am very concerned that the same as Jessica, that this will remain a owner occupied building. I have um, been in this neighborhood and area and it, unless there's some type of uh, requirement written into uh, uh, the permit, I don't feel confident that this will remain a owner occupied building, maybe for about five or six years, but then it'll get reverted to a student rental. All right. Thank you, Ms. Carroll. Other comments from the public? If you have a comment, please raise your hand on use the raise hand function on Zoom. I don't think I see any, Maureen, do you? All right. Um, this is an opportunity for the applicant to respond to some of those questions. Please keep your response to the board, not to the, uh, the public commenter. So all, all comments and responses should be directed to the board. I guess there's a couple of things that I would say before you do that. Number one, regarding the the planning board looked at the this property and had no no problem with the um, the uh, design. And I think they tend to have more interest in the the outside um, aesthetic of pretty than you. They did you go through with them the nature of the of the um, outside design of the property, and did they comment on that um, and question about that at the meeting, Mr. Holden? Um, so they were very receptive to the design that I provided. Um, obviously, there are some details missing, type of style, mm -hmm. type of siding we were planning to use, and so on. But um, my impression was that they felt that the design of the property um, fit very well into the neighborhood. Um, it's, like I said, it's, it's fairly simple and clean. Um, and there is a mix, well, although primarily Greek revival and colonial in the neighborhood. Um, and, and one of the, uh, people from the public who commented that a lot of the houses are, uh, historical homes. Um, she's correct in, in my knowledge, in the sense that our house is actually in the Massachusetts registry. Um, the front home is, uh, I don't believe it's in the national um but regardless uh the the response i got from the zoning board was that the design architecture style um and plan fit fit well into the neighborhood um and mr wasevich or maureen um that typically is that the purview of the planning board and or is it the local historic district who looks at those issues for the town we tend not to do a lot of that in the Z zba 
Well, um, I mean, the planning board, so here's the distinct difference between the ZBA and the planning board. Uh, the ZBA reviews special permits primarily for uses that um, that you need to decide uh, whether are you know compatible to the neighborhood and, and fitting with the neighborhood and, and that's so on and so forth for each particular zoning district. Uh, the planning board mostly reviews site plan re review applications, which are for buy right uses. Um, so they're not sort of indicating, they're not really discussing whether that particular use is compatible to that neighborhood in a particular zoning district. Their sort of focus is, is on the exterior uh, layout and um, and uh, and design. Um, so it can uh, uh, certainly include architecture. And then of course we have the historical commission. Um, there is no demolition being proposed here. So this did not go through the historical commission. Um, and this is not located in either of the two local historic um, right. districts in town. So they too did not um, get a chance to review or comment review on this because this. this is uh, not within their jurisdiction. Mr. Holden, do you have any other comments and responses to the public comment? Uh, specifically regarding the architecture and style, um, I think, um, you know, having a, a, a more of an aesthetic background with my building, um, and I think there are people who would agree that um, just because it's in the proximity to a Greek revival that was built in 1835 doesn't mean you should build another Greek revival um, next to it. Um, I think just finding a simple architecture that will fit um, comfortably in the vicinity and not stand out like a sore thumb um, is sort of the point here. Um, so that's specific to that. Um, is this my time to address other concerns that were expressed? Sure. Yep. yep. Um, so I think I said early on, and they might have missed it, um, that we are certainly open uh, to making it a requirement of the special permit that a dwelling unit on the property be owner occupied. Um, I have no intention, and I know I can say this today and then change my mind five years from now, um, of making this an owner occupied home and then renting it out later on down the road. Um, but I'm certainly comfortable with put that in, putting that in as a requirement of the special permit that to be an owner occupied dwelling unit on the property. Um, one of the things, like I mentioned earlier, that the zoning board had suggested, uh, sorry, the planning board had actually suggested was that it not be specific to the house. Um, but that it be specific to the property as a whole. In other words, if some at some point down the road, 20, 25 years from now, I decide to move into a portion of the front house, that that is an option and that I'm not required to live in the, the rear house. I will say, in addition to that, that um, if they were to look back at the plan that I provided, um, it is not conducive to student housing. Um, if it was being built to be student housing, it wouldn't have uh, a master suite um, with first floor living an open floor plan on the first floor. Um, it's just not conducive. It's really, it's built for a family of five and that's why I designed it the way I did for my family. And would expect that even down the road, 15, 20 years from now, if we were to choose to downsize and move into the front uh, portion of the property, that it would be a family um, moving in. I believe with the, the colleges and universities in the area, um, there's a demand for housing in faculty as well. Um, people who are in the area short term, whether it's one year or two years. Um, so I don't have any concerns down the road of it being rentable to a family. Um, and again, I'm certainly open to putting the requirement in that there be an owner occupied unit on the property at all times. Thank you, Mr. Holden. Ms. Pollock, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that um, one of the listed possible conditions uh, in your project application report, uh, it's condition six, says one of the dwelling units on the property shall remain owner occupied at all times. And so if the board goes, you know, does approve this permit and that particular condition, if in the event that um, Mr. Holden would like to request that that condition be changed or removed or modified in the future, that would require 
a uh, modification of this special permit, meaning that a legal ad would be placed in the local newspaper and the abutters that live within 300 feet of the property would be notified of regular mail, just like tonight. So abutters that received mm -hmm. um, a letter in the mail would uh, receive that. Um, and so um, that would, re again, require a amended special permit requiring a public hearing process. And then um, another possible condition that's listed um, which is um, a requirement of the zoning bylaw. Um, duplexes in um, located in the RBC, the Village Center Residence Zoning District, um, specifies that the permit shall expire upon change of ownership. So if if uh, Mr. Holden um, decides to, a it always needs to be owner occupied. Um, but if he and his family decide that they now want to live somewhere else, this permit actually will expire. And so any future owner would need to submit a new special permit for um, for um, sort of continuing this use. Yep. Thank you. Or requesting a new use. All right. Any other questions from board members? If not, um, I'd like to move to the part where we discuss, but Mr. Holden, you have something you wanna say? Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to um, respond also. There were some questions about how the title would be written and insurance. Um, it, this is, uh, it is and will be considered one piece of property. Um, the title for the property, the deed for the property will be as one property with uh, basically, I would assume as a multi unit, um, which has two separate structures on it. Um, the insurance, uh, so when it was non owner occupied, it had rental insurance on it, or I, I should say, uh, non, non uh, owner occupied insurance, which was basically fire and I think fire and water. Um, when we moved into the house back in September, we changed our policy to be a regular homeowner's policy. And Quite frankly, Mr. Holden, I don't know that that's applicable. Yeah, I don't think it's relevant. The insurance you have is not to. applicable to the to our consideration. Yeah. So, um, I hope okay. you insure. I hope the property is adequately insured. But it's it not, is. That's not something that we have to worry about. Okay. All right. Um, if there's no further questions from the board, I'd like to uh, move into the public meeting portion where we discuss the um, possible conditions. Ask any other questions that we. We may have and then um, decide whether to approve the special permit with conditions or not. Uh, so, um, uh, yes. sorry to interrupt you. It looks like uh, yep. there is a member of the public that wishes to speak. Would you like to take any other comments? Um, Ms. Barrington, you've already spoken once. Please keep it to three minutes. things. North Amherst Village Center is in the National Historic Register. It, it is all of the houses on North Pleasant and down to Fisher Street. The houses on Pine Street to Harris um, are in the, in the National Historic District. So there is that. Um, the other thing is I didn't understand um, Maureen's explanation about the, the owner occupancy requirement, whether it extends to new owners or whether it does not. If she could just say that, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, um, because um, the zoning bylaw says that this permit shall uh, expire upon change of ownership. That um, that there would be a new special permit application um, for someone that would like to um, uh, buy this property, and uh, uh, the future Z ZBA that would hear this uh, new application would then can you know would consider making it owner occupied or not uh, having that particular condition. But 
So under the hold in this 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 uh, special permit application in front of you, there is that uh, condition that would say that under this use for this owner, they would have this owner occupied condition. Again, if they know basically one day say we're done with this permit and we're moving, then there'd be a new special permit uh, application, which is it's starting all over again. So um, I hope that clarifies. I still know it's, it's short, we, it, it, Ms. Ms. Barrington, Ms. Barrington, in short, we can't find future ZBAs. But Thank for you. this owner at this time, the special permit would require owner occupancy. Thank you. A, I, I oppose yeah. this. I, I oppose your okay. grand experience uh, on those conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, the first question that I have, I'd like to move to the the um, hearing portion, the the public meeting portion. And the first question I have is really for staff, and I'd like a clarification of. Um, what complementary use means as opposed to accessory use or everything else. I tried to look it up in the, the definition of what complementary use is, which is really what we're proposing, what we're approving here. And I don't really know what that is. I, in plain language, I understand it. <laughs> I understand what complementary is, but is there a legal definition as to what complementary use is for these two buildings? Can you help us out with that? Either Maureen or Dave. I don't know if there is a, a definition that um, I can put my finger on right away. Um, the way I've heard it used, it, it would be a similar use, um, a residence for the residence, mm -hmm. complementary, something that would be in the residential realm is complementary. Um, so if there's but, not a, if there's not a, a, a specific definition that comes to our our decision as a board as to what is complementary to the current use and what is not. It really comes down to us determining what complementary means in this case. And well, we can probably take sure. the plain language, probably take the plain language usage of the meaning of that word, if that's the case. Correct. And while you look that up, uh, we can see if anybody has any questions or comments about the, this application in general before we go into conditions? So it's not in definitions. Not in definitions. Okay, so complementary is something that we will that we can use our discretion and and I would encourage us to use uh, the plain English meaning of the word complementary. Um, what I so generally I'm I'm in favor of this application. I think that. Um, it seems to make sense to me that, that it's with the existing um, that we're adding a family into a um, a neighborhood, a family a owner occupied property. Um, we are not adding additional renters to the front. It's going to be capped. If we do this, would be capped one and two as it currently is. The project seems there is enough room. It, it matches. It meets all the the uh, dimensional requirements um, that's required by the by the town. Um, and it seems to me that on, in general, it doesn't pose, it doesn't disrupt or, or, um, it's not to the demerit of the, the neighborhood, um, to have an, an additional single family home on this large property. So that's where I'm coming from. If people have certain concerns that they'd like to address with, the, with conditions or something, they could raise those here. But I think we've dealt with a lot of the a lot of those possible concerns by the conditions that are proposed by staff, and we can and put additional ones on. Ms. Parks, I'll just make uh, the comment that a family of four is different than four unrelated adults. And so I do think that it adds to the density of people and cars on that property um, with a family mm -hmm. and uh, six unrelated adults. Just want to make note of that. And it is, uh, yep. it is good to rent to families as well. Yep. Okay, I'd like, to, if there's not other comments, I'd like to proceed to the conditions, run through the conditions. Um, and as we have done before, 
what I'd like to do is go through these conditions um, and then we'll get to the, then we have to make our, our findings. So to the extent that you have a problem with any of these conditions, the time is to raise them is when I mention them. The first is the condition of a possible condition of approval, which is that it has to be built to, to this, uh, according to the documents that are, that are presented and that's standard. Uh, and those are all specifically laid out. Um, the second, the third uh, condition is what we're, is a, what has been a new standard that we're applying to rental property, whether owner occupied or not, about maintaining records regarding complaints filed with the property. We first did this a couple of applications ago and we're, we tend to, we're doing this, uh, at least we have been doing this for other properties going forward. Um, the fourth condition deals with um, submitting that log um, when the residential rental registration comes up each year. Um, number five has to, is a, it's a function of the bylaw. This in this zoning district, the permit expires upon change of ownership. Uh, number six is one of the dwelling units on this property shall remain owner occupied at all time. The question is whether we want to require that this built with the new building be owner occupied or just one one um, dwelling unit be owner occupied. Um, it's up to the board to decide. And if you if we want to discuss that, does anybody want the, the the new home to be owner required to be owner occupied? Mr. Maxfield, I'm sorry that that's requiring specifically the new home to be owner occupied or just a house on the property. That, 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 does anybody want that specific new structure to be owner occupied? Right now, the, the condition does not require that, but that was discussed in. The public and was discussed here. So, and the and the um, applicant expressed their desire that it not be applied to the new uh, property, just to a unit on the property, yeah, any unit on the property. I'm in favor of a unit on the property, uh, personally. All right. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? I, I, I would uh, second that as well. I don't I don't see any justification for simply the new unit to be owner occupied, especially with the justification given by. Mr. Holden, um, I think a unit on the property um, is more than sufficient. Yeah, and I also think with the design of the property, it's, it's unneeded. It's not likely to be student rental with that kind of a layout, I think. Um, number seven, we've talked about the number of nights uh, and the number of tenants. And so Maureen, uh, when you do the conditions, they'd be seven, um, seven days and a total of um, four, the seven days for, um, four guests, overnight guests in the front and two overnight guests in the back unit, okay? Mm -hmm. Number eight is a no, total number of people is 16 is what the owner has said they're comfortable with. And unless we feel that's you know outrageous, I think we should um, defer to, I think we can defer to an owner occupant to police that well. Um, the property management and complaint plan has to be followed. The management plan shall be returned to the any changes have to come back to us at a public meeting. The ZBA, all exterior lighting shall be designed and installed. These shielded or downcast. Um, I'd also like to add to this that if any new lights are put on the, uh, light fixtures are put on the old building, that they have to be downcast. I don't know if you intend to do that or if you're just gonna do it anyway, but if you add any new light fixtures or change the light fixtures um, in any way on the, the old building, I want them to be downcast and uh, we'd like them to be downcast and uh, dark sky compliant. So we'd have to modify that condition morning to apply to any new um, light fixtures on the old building. Um, you've got to register this number 12 requires it to be registered with the rental property bylaw program. Um, the street numbers shall be clearly marked with reflective signage and visible from the public right of way. Um, Parking shall occur on improved services only. We did note that in the, um, the site visit, it shall be maintained as needed and the parking drive area shall be constructed in accordance with the Arctic, with Article 7.1. So that means they have to be, they're improved surfaces. You can, expand it. and the um, property shall be free of litter. The four issuance of any building permit, you gotta submit a site plan to the, showing the water and sewer connections for the Department of Public Works and they have to be, a um, I think that has to be approved uh, to just be submitted, but I, I will leave the specific wording to the staff, but the intent here is that they have to be approved uh, site plan um, for the 
the water and sewer. Um, oh, that, it's the next trend. I got it. The next one does that. Uh, that's 17, 18, no more than four unrelated in individuals shall, I would say, occupy the first, the front unit, no more than two in the back, in the second unit. Um, the east and west side of the parking shall be delineated by large stones or a low stockade fence. The driveway shall have a minimum of 13 feet. We did not talk about this. That was a, that's a kind of an odd requirement that I have not noticed on other um, applications. Normally we look at 10 feet on both sides or 10 feet driveways. This one has, from the old permit, it has 13 feet plus a, a foot on each side of the driveway. Before we do away with that, um, because typically we do 10, why would that be the case? Is there any guidance from either the staff or from Mr. Holden as to why there would be a minimum of 13, 13 foot wide driveways? Mr. Holden? Um, I don't know exactly the reason for it. I would imagine, so I, I, I went back and I read um, the driveway requirements. It was my impression that it was 10 or 11 feet for a one-way driveway and uh, 18 feet for a two-way driveway. So the 13 feet really didn't right. make a lot of sense to me um, unless it was taking into consideration the need to get a fire truck back there. I'm not sure. Um, oh, that's a good point. The When we uh, did the original division of the units, we didn't do anything with the driveway, so it was left as is. I think the narrowest part of it towards the front near the street measured 11 and a half feet when I actually measured it out. Um, it's clear on both sides for several feet. Um, so it's yeah. easy to maintain a driveway of 13 feet. I'm just really not sure what the reason for it is. Um, we haven't done anything with the driveway. Once the project, uh, assuming it's approved, was completed, we would be happy because we were bringing construction vehicles in and utilities are gonna need to be run underground. The, my expectation is the entire driveway and parking area will get repaved, um, at which point we can meet any requirements needed for the width of the driveway. I'm just not sure okay. what the specific reason is for 13 feet. You know, it, what makes sense to me, Maureen, is just to um, move it to 10 feet unless the fire department has a, has a need. They should, if they can review it and they find that 10 feet is insufficient or for some public safety reason, to get to that rear house. There's some need for a, a wider driveway to get to the rear house, um, unless they show, show a need for that. I think a 10 foot wide driveway is probably adequate. Just to chime in here real quick. Yep. I believe that, um, I'm trying to think back to a project I worked on years ago uh, where I had to provide a fire access road. Um, I think the minimum was 12 feet. So, uh, you know, Mr. Holden's comment is is probably accurate. I don't know why that would have gotten lumped in, um, you know, to this at some point in history. Um, although it could just be the depth of the, um, you know, the building and or the lot itself. So my presumption, I mean, uh, I think what you're suggesting is a great idea in that you receive confirmation, of course, from fire. But my presumption is that with the construction of a rear unit, um, you will actually need the wider driveway. Um, right. So, you know, with that being said, if we have about 11 and a half, it sounds like Mr. Holden, uh, you know, measure that to, um, you know, we might have to just bump that out, which from our site visit didn't seem like much of a problem. It would just be, you know, taking out a little bit of the, uh, the grass on the side to uh, my expectation would be 12 minimum. But th those are my thoughts on it. So, Mr. Gilbert, are you willing to leave that up to the fire and police departments, public safety, or do you think we should just, or would, are you advocating for just 12 feet and leave it at that? I would advocate for 12 feet and get the feedback of fire because my expectation is that fire will request 12 minimum. From what okay. we saw on the site visit, it appeared as though, you know, if the truck had to get back there, there might be adequate, you know, turning distance. Um, but, you know, my concern would be the width. And, and because I know that that can be accomplished, I would recommend 12 feet plus feedback from fire, which should just. All right. So let's write. So then I, unless there's any objection to this, I think a condition that states 12 feet uh, wide driveway, unless public safety, fire and police believe that something wider is needed. 
No objection okay. on my part. We All can right. easily accommodate what's required. Great. Um, All right, so then lastly, um, you're gonna amend the management plan to have the trash contained in the back of the, of the front unit for the front unit, two units. Trash will be in the back of the unit hidden from public view. Yes. Okay, all right. Um, and we've done dark sky compliance. Any other conditions that people are in, interested in imposing on this application or think are necessary on this application? All right, or any other discussion? Uh, we should go to findings we have to make uh, based upon those, con assuming that those conditions would be applicable to this application, uh, would be applicable to this application. Um, we have to make certain findings. The first finding is that this is a complementary um, to the principal use of the current um, property. Uh, and as we discussed, there doesn't seem to be a, a legal definition of the word complementary. So using the plain English um, definition of complementary, it seems that adding a, a single family owner occupied dwelling unit to the property that contains two um, rental rental units currently is a complementary use. Um, so I, that the first finding I think we, that we have to make seems to me to be um, one that we can make unless there's objection. Um, secondly, we, um, so that's for section 3.01, um, we can make the finding required under section three, under section seven, parking access regulations. It seems to me that we've viewed that, that this proposal meets the requirements of section seven. And if we have the uh, fire and safety, fire and police, um, assessment of the width of the driveway um, we have a, we meet the parking requirements and the driveway requirements for the for section seven um, slope all the different areas of section seven i think are met yeah so i think sec section seven parking um, is we have made the finding that it meets those requirements it meets the dimensional requirements under Article 6, except for those which are pre-existing, um, such as the building area, the lot frontage, which are pre-existing and non-conforming and can't be changed. Everything else in terms of lot coverage, building coverage, et cetera, meets, um, meets the um, requirements of the dimensional requirements. Now to 10.38. 10.380 uh, and 10.3A1 is the proposal is suitably located in the neighborhood in which it is proposed. Um, I believe the construction of a single family home is um, complementary principal use and is um, suitably located in this neighborhood. There's a mix of housing in the area, um, including condominiums, single family homes, duplexes, and a three unit building. 10.382, 383, 385, and 387 all deal with being a nuisance to air, water, flood, noise, odor, vibration, et cetera or being a substantial inconvenience to the abutters or pedestrians being reason, does it reasonably protect adjoining properties? Does it provide convenient and safe vehicular movement within the site? Um, I, I think the proposal provides those things and we can find that it does not constitute a nuisance. Um, it does not constitute a substantial inconvenience or um, it does protect neighbors and it's convenient and safe for vehicular traffic. 10.384. Um, Mr. Judge? Yes. Uh, so yes. Dave Wiskevitz has raised his hand. Yes, Dave, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah. all right. Uh, this is going back a little bit, but in the, in the conversation about driveways under the section for common and individual driveways under 7.71, it says an individual driveway shall be constructed in accordance with same standards, but not be less than 12 feet in width and need not provide clear shoulders. So, that may be at some point in time why it was built the way it was, and but it, it is looking for a 12 foot wide, at least for a, an individual driveway. Thank you. And that fits with the condition that we talked about having a 12 foot wide and less, um, right? 12 foot wide on the driveway and less fire and safety requires more. Right. Okay. Yep. 
Thank you, Mr. Westravitz. Um, 10.384 adequate facilities would be provided for the operation. Um, I think that's we've, that utility services will be provided, and that is also um, contained in the um, in a later um, 10.38 uh, article. Uh, the proposal meets 10.386. The proposal meets the parking requirements and the utility services in terms of 10.384 they're going to have to require they're going to have to submit utility and have them approved by the town before before building requirement would be a building um, permit would be issued um, off street loading is not applicable 10.390 10.389 again is the uh, condition coming from the public works and i think we'd meet the requirements of 10.389 regarding Dispose and storage of sewage, refuse, recyclables, and having the trash in the garage for the new building and the trash behind the old building away from the street. 10.390 um, deals with the protection from flood and water runoff. Um, the town engineer has reviewed the, the drainage plan and, and has been satisfied with it, so that meets 10.390. 10.391 protects the proposal protects to the extent feasible, unique, or historic uh, net, uh, fe scenic features. The architectural style of the proposed house keeps with the architectural style of the existing two family home on the property. I think that in our view, that that is the case. 10.392 deals with adequate landscaping. Um, the one thing there we did not have a specific condition on is that additional screening between the property of the, the parking area and the neighboring property but I'm going to um, assume that, you've, that you have heard the board's desire here that you look at what's reasonable to make sure that you're not having light trespass on the neighboring property by the, by the uh, parking lot, as opposed to saying that you have to put shrubs or a fence in, we'll leave it up to um, assume that you will do that, and you'll analyze that and do that, okay? Mr. Holden? Sorry, I had to find my mouse. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Yep. Okay, good. Um, and we also are requiring um, dark sky compliance, including any replacement of any existing structures, like fixtures. Um, there's no wetlands resources, so 10.394 does not really apply. 10.395 um, does it create disharmony with respect to the terrain and use and scale of architecture and buildings in the vicinity. Uh, no, it doesn't. It seems to be within scale and use of other homes in the area. 10.396, screening for storage area loading docks. We've seen that on the condition, so I think we meet 10.396. 10.397, rec adequate recreational facilities. There's sufficient open space. It meets the uh, open space requirements of the dimensional requirements. 10.398 is in harmony with the general purpose of this bylaw and the goals of the master plan. The proposal is in harmony with the master plan, section four, objective H3, which encourages opportunities for proper infill development. The board needs to determine whether the proposal meets these applicable zoning bylaws sections, including 3.0, 3.320, 3.3211, and 10.38. So I think we have um, feel that it does all those things up to 10.398, and I think it does meet the uh, general purpose and intent of the bylaws, which is 10.398. So, um, if there are, unless there are any other comments regarding this application, I would entertain a motion that we approve the app, special permit application with the conditions so stated and um, based upon the findings we have made uh, pursuant to those conditions. Do I have a motion to do so? so Mr. Moved. Maxfield? So moved. Do I have a second, Mr. Meadows? Second. Any discussion on the motion? If there's no further discussion, the vote occurs on the motion to approve the special permit application with conditions based upon the findings that we have made. This is a roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Gilbert. Aye. 
Motion carries. The motion is unanimous. Um, motion is approved. Special permit is approved. Mr. Holden, congratulations. Um, make sure that you take a look at that property, um, the fencing and the screening for the additional parking. Um, we did not put that in the conditions, but I'm assuming that you'll do that. And good luck with the good luck with the project. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, fellow members, um, we're getting on towards eight o'clock. I want to take a like a three minute break if I can. Um, is that all right with everybody else? Because I'll be a much happier oh, yeah. chairman. I think you'll be much happier as well. So uh, let's let's come back in less than five.
All right, everybody. Um, everybody back. We got myself, Mr. Maxfield, Mr. Gilbert, Ms. Parks. Good, and Mr. Meadows. All right. Second order of business we have tonight is um, ZBA FY 2023-03, Fort River Solar 2, LLC, requesting a special permit to modify the previously approved special permit ZBA FY 2019-09 for the proposed modification to condition 23 and to request a permit extension in order to allow additional time to commence construction beyond the September 12, 2020 expiration. Under Massachusetts General Law 40A, Section 9, and Section 10.33 of the Zoning Bylaw, at 191 West Pomeroy Lane, Map 19D, Parcel 10, Flood Prone Conservancy, FPC, Neighborhood Residents, RN, and Outlying Residents, RO, Zoning Districts. Um, we had a site visit on Tuesday morning where we walked, uh, we entered over by the, the old golf shop. We walked, um, met with the representative of the, the applicant, walked along the property from um, golf shop and north to the river, observing the various um, plants that have grown up and the vegetation that have grown up since the um, golf course is not in use and since the town has taken over the property. Um, in, this, in the intervening two or three years, we then had a discussion about the types of of the the types of application of type and application of herbicides that would be used, where they would be used. I was clarified that they'd be used within the colored areas of this map, not just along the purple areas of this map, but they'd be used where invasive plants do occur. Um, we walked along then we walked over to the a bridge section of this property uh, where we looked at a, a bridge that has to be at least repaired if not replaced uh, at some point to allow access back into the solar fields um, we also observed where the solar fields are going to be and they're not going to be along this area of uh, where the where the herbicide is going to be applied and this is mostly for the um, elimination of invasive plants and the protection of the wood turtle, which is uh, lives in the Fort River. Um, that's pretty much the nature of the site visit. It took a long time because we tromped over much of the much of the area, but in general, it was all a discussion, basically a discussion of the type of herbicide and the method of application of that herbicide and what the um, what is required by both the Conservation Commission as well as state law. Mr. Gilbert, did you have anything you wish to add to that site visit summary? Good. No, I think, I think you captured it, Dan. Um, I just wanna go through the conditions, I mean, the, the submissions that we've received. Um, for this, we've received a special permit application. The, the applicant has submitted a special permit application, an amendment to a special permit, um, exhibit A, B, C, D, E, and F, all of which deal with um, special permit extension requests, a conservation management permit, a memo to the Conservation Commission, compliance conditions related to the special permit and the estimated construction schedule. It also, um, we have a, a submission regarding bridge number nine, which is that bridge that we talked about, a load rating prepared by Northeast Engineers and Consultants dated August 1st, 2020. So it comes from the applicant. Our the um, town submissions include, or the staff submissions include, a project application report dated August nineteenth, special permit decision, um, ZBA FY twenty from from two thousand nineteen, as well as a public meeting summary from FY twenty twenty one. Also comments from the wetlands administrator dated July fourteenth, twenty twenty, and allotted dated July 16th, 2020. I don't think there are any other additional, you had some, Maureen, you had some email conversation with, um, but none of that needs to be submitted. Did email conversations regarding the two or five years of the um, requirement to maintain the property after construction is substantially complete. Does that need to be included in the public record? Uh, we can certainly include it. Yes, I, I yeah. corresponded with uh, AMP Energy, um, clarifying 
in confirming that the permit holder would be responsible for providing uh, the invasive species management, including hand pulling, cutting, and the use of herbicides and routine maintenance during the first five years uh, right. once the plan is implemented. And then um, and, and that five years uh, starts at the end of the construction of the solar project. And then at the sixth on the... Um, and then um, beginning in the sixth year following completion of of the initial uh, initial habitat management actions and thereafter the property owner of the town of Amherst will be responsible for maintaining the habitat management area, including the invasive species management and routine maintenance. And that's important because when, during the site visit, we thought it was two years and it's just been corrected to five years. So Correct. that's important. Um, and needs to be corrected for the record. So um, with that being said, um, I, the, I'd like to turn it over to the applicant. Um, I think who is going to represent the applicant and make the presentation. Please identify yourself for the record. Uh, thank you to the board. Uh, my name is Lawrence Cook. I work from the uh, I work for the uh, the applicant for River Solar. Um, I am English. I do have a tendency to talk rather quickly. It is difficult for me remotely um, to gauge people's uh, expressions. So if any, if I talk too quickly or I pronounce something in a way that you don't understand, please feel free to uh, to interrupt me, and I'll uh, I'll do my best to get to, to make myself understood. So, and Mr. Uh, Cook, I won't... Um, that's Mr. Cook, I would say that your, your uh, volume is low. So um, so for some of us old ears, and especially for us min uh, Midwesterners who have a little, who always turn up the volume when I listen to an English um, detective movie on TV or show. So anything from BBC. Yeah, is, is, sorry, is that any better? So <laughs> turn up the volume and speak a little slower for these Midwestern ears, if you would. I'm having some technical difficulties now. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Can somebody raise their hand if you yep, can hear we me? Can. We can hear you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I, I'm, I've been waylaid uh, from another meeting, so I'm having to do this from my truck. So I'm not uh, in my usual technical office. So, yes, thank you for correcting that uh, original um, mistake. It was five years. Uh, what we have uh, is this uh, management area and a habitat establishment that goes to the north of Fort River Soda between our farm and the river. Um, that is subject to a separate permit that is being granted. Um, and within the uh, operations and maintenance plan, we have these three establishment areas. Now, the ones that say invasive species management, the current flora and fauna will remain, um, and we just deal with the uh, any invasive species in those, in those areas, but all uh, native species will remain. Then we have the two establishment areas, one forested and one is a meadow. Um, and both of those areas are also subject to the same uh, invasive species management. Uh, we're looking at uh, a little over 18 acres in total. Um, it's broken out at 7.2 acres of meadow, uh, 7.5 uh, acres of forest, and about 3.8 acres of existing habitat that is going to be enhanced uh, by the invasive species management. Um, the operations and maintenance plan calls out uh, the invasive species to be managed, um, which is the, the list there. Um, and the, uh, uh, the, the method to deal with it is, um, is included. So it's a combination of hand pulling, cutting and herbicide. There are some, uh, some species that uh, cutting and herbicide uh, or um, just herbicide use uh, is going to be suitable for. Uh, and, and so uh, this is why we've come back um, to, uh, to ask for a, a variation on that, on that condition that was placed on us. Um, we, uh, the, once it is completed, that is when the time starts. So it's not necessarily connected to the solar farm but it's to the completion of this uh, habitat establishment. So once that is completed, uh, the first two years will be subject to uh, two inspections where um, they will be highlighting invasive species that need to be removed. Uh, after the first two years, that turns into an annual inspection. So the, the, the plan is not that we will be there constantly spreading herbicide around, dealing with things, is, is based on those inspections. Um, uh, we would propose using a, 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 an AquaSafe herbicide, 
um, and also limit its use to uh, um, the correct weather. Um, there'd be a, a forward look at the expected weather to make sure that we're not uh, doing it uh, ahead of any rains that might wash uh, anything in um, before the, uh, the herbicide itself is, uh, is neutralized and dissipated. Um, it, uh, applications will only be done by a licensed contractor uh, with the correct accreditations. Um, and that's, uh, that's kind of uh, where we're at. So uh, I'd welcome any questions. Oh, sorry, I, I'm unable to hear you. Yes, Steve, I can't, we can't hear you. Yeah. Phone, my earplug, can you hear me now? We can. We can hear you now. Okay, all right, great. Um, so that, that deals, deals with the invasive plant management and the herbicide application. Also speak quickly, if you would, about the need for an extension or your request for an extension yes. of the, of the uh, commencement of construction. Yes, so obviously the, um, the, the site was given its permission in, uh, in 2019, um, then 2020 um, COVID hit um, and very little progressed. Uh, there were day-for-day uh, -day extensions um, provided, which is why the, uh, the two years uh, special permit date runs out in uh, September 12th this year, despite the permit being granted uh, in 20, uh, 2019. Uh, the, uh, our involvement um, as Amp Solar as project owners, we acquired the, the, the land uh, earlier this year in, in early spring. Uh, we dealt with the land donation to the town um, and we're moving forward with the, uh, with the final designs. Uh, and unfortunately, two things have hit us. Um, uh, it, it will come as no surprise to anybody uh, that there are supply chain issues. Um, we're dealing with um, some fairly sophisticated electronic equipment. Uh, it needs computer chips. Those computer chips have been, uh, have been hard to come by. And the, uh, the inverters uh, were, were going to be uh, later than needed. Um, there's also a, uh, a, uh, a court case, a federal court case that was going through that was relating to solar modules. Um, and it, uh, uh, unresolved, it had the potential to have 200% tariffs uh, applied to any solar modules. Um, because we couldn't select a solar module, because we were trying to find inverters to meet the time, uh, we were unable to commence designs until those two, two issues were, were, were resolved. Uh, we are in a position now that our uh, electrical designs are going to be uh, completed within the next few days um, uh, and, and ready to, uh, oh, sorry, next few weeks. Uh, to start the permitting process, but the, uh, uh, for us to be able to uh, get those permits approved, mobilize the site and commence work by September 12th uh, is, is not possible. Uh, so that is why we're looking for the extension um, uh, of just one year. Great, thank you. Um, any questions from members of the board regarding this application? What I will say is that um, I don't know if any of us um, are experts in, in uh, plant management, invasive species. Um, we, as a board, we rely more upon the experts uh, at the state and at the CONCOM, the Con Conservation Commission, to make a decision as to whether this is, the, is a environmentally a safe and effective way to deal with the um, problem of these invasive plants. Um, and in both cases, the CONCOM and the state believe that this is the correct way to do it. The original um, special permit had a limitation on the use of herbicides, and that I think is, um, is proven to be, at least in terms of the experts, not an effective way to do it without, without herbicides, that you need you know, some herbicide use. So, uh, and we have a plan for doing that, and that plan, or they have a plan for doing that, and that plan has been approved by the relevant agencies comes to us because we're the ones that granted a special permit. If there's going to be a modification of special permit, we've got to approve it. So I'm comfortable with the herbicide um, plan that they have, and I'm comfortable with the people that have blessed it, knowing what they're doing. Um, and in terms of the, the uh, extension for um, another period of time so that they could get started on this without losing the, well, without defaulting on the, <clears throat> the project, um, I, I can see where the 
pandemic has caused real problems. And probably Craig, you know more, Mr. Meadows, you know more about this than any of us uh, on this panel. But that's probably, it seems to me, a reasonable thing. And even if it wasn't reasonable, there's a, there's a, a bond and other, a performance bond, a surety bond uh, placed that has been filed by the, by the applicants in order to uh, ensure that they will eventually um, do the work. So not only do I think it's a reasonable uh, delay, but we have a protection on the backside that we're not um, allowing them just to continue to extend this with ad infinitum. So, um, and the extension isn't forever, it's just for, uh, I think it's two years. Um, so uh, for those two reasons, I think that the two things we're requesting are reasonable, but I'm, I was on, at the site and I had a chance to ask the questions and if anybody does have questions to ask, this is the time to do that. Just, just, just as a correction, Steve, we're we're, yep. we're only uh, we're only asking for a year. We would uh, yep. we are entitled to ask for two for an extension, but we are only asking for a year because uh, we, we uh, we're only looking we're only looking for a couple of months delay from being able to start past the date. You know, as soon as I said a year, I knew I was wrong, <laughs> yeah. and I saw I did see Maureen's face kind of twitch, so mm. I knew I, I knew I made a mistake. So yep. Yep, thank you for correcting me. All right, um, any other comments? Questions? I, I will oh. say that, that you know, I, I've got a project that we were supposed to have completed last October. And because of supply chain difficulties, we are just about to finish it uh, this month. <laughs> so uh, I think I think one year is is a minimum amount that they might want. If I were if I were them, I would probably push it to 18 months. So the, the equipment that we have has been ordered. We also have other deadlines um, to do with the uh, uh, statement of qualification uh, with, uh, under the SMART program, of which we get a year plus six months as a paid extension. Uh, and so both of those would elapse uh, within the time. So uh, yes, we, we could ask for, a, for additional time from you, but we'll, we'll have bigger problems than an elapsing permit um, if, we, uh, uh, if, if it's not done by then. <laughs> I wish you good luck. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Any other questions, comments? Mr. Maxfield? Yeah, I was just going to comment that, that this seems pretty straightforward. My only questions as well are uh, ones I can't answer necessarily about herbicides. So I trust I trust the people with the expertise in the uh, Fish and Wildlife DEP and the ComCon to, uh, to get that one right. So yeah, I'm in favor of this, uh, this project. Um, Maureen, are there any public comment, any other board members? If not, I will turn it to public comments. Do we have, do we have anybody raising their hand? I don't see. We have a uh, Michael Lipinski. Yeah, Mr. Lip Mr. Lipinski, can you please identify yourself for the record? And yes, uh, Michael, about three Michael minutes. Lipinski, 167 Shootsbury Road, Amherst. Um, you mentioned the bridge on your tour, and I see the a, a bridge load rating supposedly prepared on August 1st, uh, 2022 in, in one of the packages. I was wondering if you could explain what you saw and what you think that bridge needs, because to me it looks like that's a major obstacle to keeping this project on target and on schedule. Thank you, Mr. Lipinski. Um, Mr. Cook, did you yes. explain? Uh, you, you, you did a, you went into depth uh, what you were planning to do with that bridge, both temporarily during construction and then permanently. Could you please yeah. describe that? So, uh, if, if you can still see my screen, I'm just running the cursor over the bridge crossing uh, that we have here. Uh, there is an existing bridge with, um, with, with 18 inch um, I beams, steel I beams that cross with a, uh, a concrete deck. And, uh, and a wooden handrail uh, along the side. Uh, when the bridge was uh, initially assessed two years ago, uh, the recommendation was that uh, it had a sufficient bridge uh, uh, weight rating uh, for the proposed construction traffic. However, the uh, concrete um, 
uh, uh, pad that, that goes across it was degraded in some areas and that the remedy was to, uh, to, to cut out the affected area, uh, install a head wall and then uh, uh, add additional concrete at the, uh, at the front. Um, because that was two years ago and we're moving into the construction phase now, uh, uh, last month we, we had Northeastern uh, update their report. They, uh, they re-inspected the bridge to make sure nothing had changed in the two years since they did their last report. Um, and the, uh, there, there had been, uh, because there's a crack that runs across, there'd been some water go in, it's washed a little bit further away, just patching it wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't going to be suitable. So now the proposal is that there is a, a, a brand new timber deck uh, that will go across uh, the bridge um, using substantial timbers, um, which also have the added benefit of it being easier to, to have a more effective guardrail running along the side. Um, we are discussing with our contractor at the moment about the, the possibility of using a, a temp bridge that would just lay over the top of it um, so that once we do the bridge repairs at the conclusion of the project, uh, that, that it hasn't been subject to all of the construction traffic, um, which... It, it, it isn't a problem, but it will just obviously leave a nice brand new fresh bridge that will very rarely, it will, will twice a year see a, uh, a, a lawnmower or a landscaper going across to cut the grass in, in the solar farm itself. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the plan at the moment is to, 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 to repair the bridge, but we're waiting for a proposal to possibly use a temp bridge in the same place, uh, as long as the, uh, the, the CONCOM approve that uh, as would be on the wetland there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cook. All right. If there are no other questions from the board, I don't think we have any other comments from the public, do we, Maureen? That was it, I think. If not, I'd like to move to the um, public meeting portion of this, where we um, make our findings and discuss conditions. Um, since this is a, you know, it is an amendment to an existing existing special permit uh, conditions, all the existing conditions are going to continue to apply except those which we have have um, modified or, or changed in, in some way. So the conditions proposed by staff, which I think are reasonable is first that everything has, that everything has to be built as per the, the uh, plans that have been submitted, that the herbicide treatment shall be limited to the application and use under, under the conservation management permit, that's the one that's on file, that's what they've been working under. The construction is permitted, will shall commence no, and that should be no later, not no latest, but no later than September 12th, 2023. So that's the one year rather than two for the commencement of construction. And all conditions under the previously approved ZBA special permit shall be followed at all times with the exception of the two modifications that we have here. Um, the only, I think those are all the conditions that we need. And the only finding we have to make is under 10.394, the proposal avoids to the extent feasible impact on steep slopes, floodplains, scenic views, grades, changes in wetlands. The herbicide application is proposed to eradicate invasive species, establish the restoration areas required by the National Heritage and Endangered Species Program for work proposed in rare species habitat. Conservation management plan is a requirement of the project from the MA Division of the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. As such, the Conservation Commission recognizes that this work is essential and in the benefit of such resources and species on the site. The Conservation Commission is aware of the CMP and the CMP is part of the order of conditions approved for the work on the property. All other aspects of 10.38, I think are not applicable um, for this application. So, um, oh, I guess also 10.3, excuse me, 10.398, is it suitable with uh, and in harmony with the general purpose and the, the bylaws and the master plan? And yes, it is. It's already been approved, and this does not change that suitability and, and harmonious nature of the project with the master plan. So um, unless there's any questions or any other additional conditions that people wish to discuss or propose, I would entertain a motion that we approve the special permit request condition with the conditions outlined in the staff draft with the minor modification made at the at this meeting. Do I have such a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? 
Mr. Maxfield seconds. We have a motion from Ms. Parks. Mr. Maxfield seconds it. Is there any discussion on the motion? If there's no discussion on the motion, the vote occurs on the motion to approve special permit application. Um, Ten uh, FY 2023-03 Fort River Solar to approve with conditions as um, identified in, uh, during the meeting. This is the roll call vote. Chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. Motion is unanimous. The motion carries. Uh, congratulations, Mr. Cook. You've got your special permit modification. Good luck with the invasive species. Thank you very much. And if any of the ZBA has any uh, any, any comments or questions, uh, post this. Um, feel free to reach out to me at any time. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next order of business is a public hearing regarding our rules and regulations. Um, the the instant reason of doing this is the desire to um, reevaluate the legal fees, that, the fees that are charged for legal um, uh, notice to applicants for uh, special permits. And, um, and they, that's something that's being done by the town in several respects uh, with several, uh, several boards. And so we have in our bylaws the fees set out. And if we wish to change those fees we have to vote on that as a as a board and to change the bylaws uh, the concern has been and maureen and dave can go into more detail the concern has been that the town is effectively subsidizing the uh, these application fees and other fees whereas now we charge 75 dollars i think it is for for um, a legal notice and it can run you know the averages $500, $600 can vary, but it can be easily $500 and normally is something in a $500 range. Um, so the, at the present time, um, it's the desire on the part of the town and the staff and the planning department to have a more consistent, and, and right now boards do various different things. So the desire is right now is to have something that's kind of consistent across some of the boards um, so that there's not a hodgepodge of different, fee, of different fees but to try to recoup some of the money that is being spent by the town planning department that uh, should be coming from the applicant. And as a result, the, the suggestion from the town staff and the planning department is to raise the fees from 75 to $300 effective uh, this year. So that would be a significant increase, but it doesn't cover all the costs that the, is incurred by the town. Um, those items are, and so that, I think you have from you a, um, a memo from Chris Brestrup um, to Maureen and Robert Mora talking about what other um, boards have done. The planning board moved from 75 to 300. Um, the historical commission bases it on square footage. I don't know if they're going to be reevaluating. And the historic district doesn't require as, you know, as much as we have, as much work as we have that they're only having $50. Um, but this the this is appendix b in your rules and regulations so page 32 of the rules and regs of the current fee structure and we would be looking to amend those they're asking us to amend the fee structure to put to um require a 30 a 300 dollar uh, fee as opposed to a 75 dollar um, legal advertisement fee now, I, I looked at this and I thought, geez, we really ought to, in the in an ideal world, I would think that if we, we bifurcate this in some ways, but I want this kind of comp, um, consistent across the planning board and us, that if you have a for-profit, large, a large um, project of a non-owner occupant, that they ought to pay the full cost of whatever it is. If they're gonna go out there to make money. That's the whole point of this. Um, if they ought to pay the full fare, and if you have a homeowner, an owner-occupied single or, or duplex, and it's just what they, I'm not as concerned about them paying the whole freight. I think if we have a set amount for them to pay $300 or something, 
it seems to me that that's it's not awful for the town to subsidize its own residents to do something you know as simple as a changing a fence or do other things that are required requires a special permit but um, I think if you're looking at for-profit operations or non-owner occupant rental housing there's no reason for the town to subsidize the legal requirements uh, for them but that right now is not what's before us and I think we should probably try to coordinate that with the planning board and so I would I would seek to talk to the planning board about doing a doing something that, so that we're, we're harmonizing our requirements so that there's not what difference between us and the planning board and other similarly situated uh, boards but for the meantime I think we ought to try to get as much money as we can into the coffers of the city um, and the proposal from the staff and the planning department is to raise this to three hundred dollars that's the big change in the in the rules and regs that are before us today the other changes are a clarification number one of some some pronouns um, we used to have he she's we've become more specific to generally say the chair or the vice chair or whatever they is whatever it is um, the person is as opposed to he she and we also have a clarification that if you have a change to a variance a special permit or a comprehensive permit those changes require the same kind of vote to approve it that was required in the first instance so uh, so there's no confusion that if you're amending the special permit you, the final vote needs four out of five uh, members to vote for it if you're doing a comprehensive permit it requires three out of five and that is just clarifying what we was a question that we had at one of our meetings uh, more re most recently and that clarifies it so those are the basic changes I think Maureen is there any that uh, other things that you would like to identify as changes in the rules and regs oh, oh, well uh, first Craig uh, uh, raised his hand oh well, I, I, yep I simply want to know uh, does it have to be a specific dollar amount or can we do essentially what Steve is suggesting uh, make the amount equal to whatever the cost of, of the legal fees are for submission to the local papers, um, which seems to me reasonable. Uh, I, I, and we could make exemptions for minor things, as Steve was saying, but, um, but it seems to me that if anybody's applying for a ZBA permit, that they could then uh, pay for the, the submission of legal fee to the local people. Maureen, it does, do some of the boards now require they pay the, some towns I know require that they pay the full amount. So the, the planning department recommends that we have a flat fee of $300 opposed to finding out what the exact amount is. So the we did reach out to the Daily Hampshire Gazette and they charge uh, per half inch. So every legal ad um, is slightly different. So it could be like for uh, the average cost um, um, could be, you know, there could be a difference of a few dollars per legal ad. So it could be for 289 versus one, the next one could be for $311. So we would prefer just to have a flat fee of $300 and, and sort of call it a day, if you will. Because it would save a step for both the applicant and for staff. So we would want to take the average um, and, um, and, and uh, require $300. So the answer is it, it could be done, but it requires more work to, you have to, to do it differently for each application. You have to have Correct. a different calculation for each application. Yeah. Okay. Is this a change that is probably going to be happening annually as the fees increase from the paper? It could. And so actually that's a nice dovetail of the other request, um, which is shown here um, on page one of the rules and regs. Um, let's see here. So the first change is just to add another, um, clarify that it's four associate members. Um, and then here it says the regular members shall also adopt and or amend these rules and regulations, including Appendix A, C, and D. Um, and 
Hold on one second. And uh, those would be, require a vote of at least three members of the five member board at a public hearing. And Appendix A, just to refresh everyone's memory, is the traffic impact statement. We have an appendix on that. C is relative to project review fees. So those are in relation to um, requiring a peer review under Mass General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53G. Um, and then D is in context of um, dark sky compliant lighting. Um, so those, if the board would like to amend the rules and regs, including Appendix A, C, and D, uh, we would need at least three uh, affirmative votes at a public hearing. A public hearing, again, uh, requires that a legal ad is placed in the Daily Hampshire Gazette. And um, and so we would like to ask that um, the board um, consider uh, allowing that any amendment to Article B, which is the application fees, uh, require a vote of at least three members at a public meeting. So the planning department is in the red by a significant amount of money uh, for legal ads. I think it's over $10,000 um, that we are in, in the red for this year for, for um, paying, uh, for not having enough money for, um, for the legal ads. And so even holding tonight's meeting, we had to put a legal ad in for, for this item, which um, is kind of, uh, was it kind of stung in a way because we really don't have the money to place these legal ads. So in the event that we, the, the planning department wants to revisit the application fees or the legal ad fees, we would like to do so at a public meeting so we can reduce the amount of money that we have to um, do for advertising. So if I may, Craig, one of the, Mr. Meadows, one of the things that I would, I was going to ask um, is that we consider the request of the staff and the planning department for this first bump that you empower me to go to the planning board and other boards, especially the planning board and say, let's see if we can coordinate this and let's see if we can reduce the subsidization of the town taxpayers for these applications. Maybe we should think of something, an exception for minor or owner occupied, see if we can come up with something that makes more sense and just this flat number that doesn't really, uh, um, solve the town's problem and maybe, you know, more expensive than it sh should be for a minor application and see if we can come up with a, something consistent that works across the boards and come with, come back with that sometime this fall. That's what I would like to do, but, and move on this for the time being and then get something better and have a meeting on that. So that would be my request. Makes sense to me. We've got yep. two, other, two other hands raised. Yep. Uh, Ms. Marshall. Welcome, nice to hear your voice. Thank you, had to be happy to be with you, but Mr. Maxfield had his hand up first, but on the other hand, you're the boss, so. You <laughs> yeah, go right ahead. Okay, I just wanna make sure I understand these two documents. Um, Ms. Pollock sent us a memo that had gone to the, or about the planning, suggestions made to the planning board about what they do with their fees. And that if I understand it, the planning staff is suggesting to the planning board that their applicants pay, pay the full fee, whatever it is, but no. they are proposing that applicants to the ZBA are paying a flat fee. Is that right? I'm, uh, I'm confused about yeah. how these are relating. Yeah, so the planning board recently uh, increased their fee, their legal ad fee from $75 to $300. And so that memo, I think, was um, a part of the discussion of when they reviewed the legal ads and ultimately approved them. So, so they, right now we're consistent or no, sorry, what you're we, suggesting would make us consistent. Right. Correct. Yep. Okay. But can I ask one follow on to that? Is, is there any change in when this process of when the applicant is paying the fee, whatever it is, like they're paying it up front and then the town cuts the invoice? That was all very confusing. And I don't know that we need to work it out right here. But Yeah, so 
um, for both the planning board and the ZBA, when an applicant submits their application materials, they're also submitting a check and that includes the legal ad and the application fee. And so, um, so we won't accept the application. We won't file the application with the town clerk until we get this check as well as all the required submissions. And then when it is filed with the town clerk, we schedule the public hearing and we will write the legal ad and uh, staff will email the Gazette the legal ad and the town of Amherst has an account with the Daily Hampshire Gazette. So um, so it's sort of funneled that way of receive the check, the check gets deposited in the town account and then the town then pays uh, the Gazette with our, with our um, with our money. So um, so the applicant doesn't need to reach out to the Gazette, um, the, the town staff is. And I, I would add that um, sort of having, making the applicant go through the Gazette, personally, I feel that for me, um, that that creates uh, more of a headache um, in some ways, because I would have to make sure that the applicant goes and does it. And there's, there's a lot of, um, deadlines that I have to meet um, and um, and so if the applicant forgets the legal ad then we have to cancel the meeting and um, there's a um, unnecessary sort of burden on staff to um, sort of have to um, hold uh, at times maybe hold the applicant's hand to make sure that they do something so our approach of of them giving us a check and then we will handle the rest is, is more smoothly and more time efficient in addition, it is not the applicant's responsibility to file them, but it's the town's responsibility to file this for the meeting. So you, you, the staff really has to be in charge of filing this legal notice because it's they're, they're the ones required to do it. Yeah. Mr. Maxfield. Um, first, I have a question. When we continue a hearing to another date, so the applicant comes to us and we, we don't make a decision then, they have to do they have to pay another 75 for the, the legal fee for that meeting or no it's only the one-time fee and then do, well do... Uh, yeah so that's a good question so you know if the board if an applicant is agreeable to continue a public hearing because a b and c that more information is needed um more testimony is needed uh, whatever the scenario is <laughs> Um, so the board uh, would then make a motion to continue the public hearing to a date and time certain, and then therefore you wouldn't need to create a new legal ad. However, I, there are some exemptions um, exceptions to the rule. So if if the board by accident didn't continue to a date certain, they kind of maybe blanked and didn't say the date or the time. Um, a legal ad would actually you would have to do a, a new legal ad. Um, so that that's a rarity, but um, but for nine out of ten times, um, you would need to do a new legal ad. Got it. Um, all right. So when somebody comes to us, they only have to pay the seventy five once. We're looking up that to three hundred, which I, I I don't necessarily think is incredibly steep, but the idea of yeah, somebody coming here for a, a fence issue or something like that, that it costs three hundred dollars to come before the ZBA seems a bit much to me. And I really, really appreciate um, what you said, Mr. Chair, uh, on how to go about actually creating two different systems for you know, for-profit enterprises versus just, you know, somebody wants to get a uh, dwelling unit for their, an, uh, an additional dwelling unit for like their mother-in-law or something like that, wouldn't have to, to pay the whole thing. Um, and I like the idea of, of trying to figure out how to do that, but I don't want to raise our fee to 300 in the interim while we work that out. I, I would feel more comfortable keeping it at 75 just because if that's something that that takes more time for us to get there, does it end up being, you know, do we get it done in two months, three months? Does this end up being something that we don't get taken care of for a year? So the entire next year, do we just have people coming in looking for their fence, they're now out $300 just to come and talk to the ZBA because we didn't get around to, uh, I think, coming up with a better system. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Maxfield. Maureen. So the planning department does recommend that the, the ZBA um, uh, increase their legal ads to $300 uh, in keeping with the planning board. Um, the planning department is in um, um, is in the red by over ten thousand um, dollars. We do not have the funding to uh, pay um, to make up the cost for these legal ads. Um, someone needs to pay it, um, pay them. And I, I will say that the planning board and the planning department uh, recommends that these legal ads be increased to three hundred dollars. Um, as a starting point, the legal ads on average cost about five hundred dollars. So we're actually not increasing it to uh, one to to um, to the equal amount of it, but we feel that this is a starting point. But um, we uh, do not want to keep this at seventy five dollars because again, the town does not have the finances to sort of subsidize these legal ads for the newspaper industry. You know, I. I... One of the things that I think is instructive is what other towns were doing. Um, and I, I'm looking for, I, I saw that earlier and I don't have that paper, but I seem to recall that many of the local communities, South Hadley, Hadley and others um, have a charge much more than um, the $75. Some of them, oh, here it is. Hadley says, they set, set the fee high enough to cover mailing and publication of legal ads. Sunderland charges 150 for legal ad and mailings. Money goes into general fund. Deerfield, advertising fee paid directly to the Greenfield recorder by the applicant. South Hadley, uh, public hearing advertisement. Applicant pays actual cost billed directly to the applicant from the newspaper. So, you know, we are the lowest in the area at current. Um, Sunderland is, is got one charges 150. We're about half of that. We'd be twice their fee if we go to 300 for at least temporarily without some kind of a break for small or or um, owner occupied properties. It seems to me that um, a lot of not everything is is um, is owner occupied and minor. I think that that the $300 is something that the town needs the money. Um, we can either pay it by people who use the services of the town and the ZBA, or we just pay it through higher taxes imposed upon everybody. And I guess in my thinking, Dylan, is that this is probably is, is not too much to, in, to impede somebody or inhibit somebody from going to, a, um, to ask for a special permit for the time being, um, especially if they think that we're gonna be looking, the type of person that might inhibit would be a small single family owner or an owner occupied person who needs a minor change, a minor um, change that doesn't cost very much. And if they know that we're looking at some kind of a bifurcated system, maybe they wait for a couple of months until we come up with that. But in the meantime, the need for the money is real and we either all pay for it on taxes or we ask those people who are using the services to pay for it. And that's really where I come down at the time being. I mean, I, I, I certainly agree. I don't like the idea of us subsidizing, especially, you know, deep pocket developers who, who want to come to us. But I, my, my only issue here with raising fees is it, it does further a system that I, I something like the ZBA is a, it can be a very costly undertaking for people. And the idea of just increasing costs that will be negligible to the people who have the deep pockets to pay it, but might not be uh, negligible to the people who don't. I mean, is there a way even even tonight that we could could say that we're raising fees on uh, non owner occupied uh, applications? If we do that, I'm 100% on board with that. I think we could even just do that for a starting point and leave it for 75 to uh, owner occupied. And at the end of the day, if, if people really disagree with me on this one, and that 300 just isn't such a bad cost. I can see it, but I, I, I personally am not not on board with with raising the fees, um, increasing the the cost of coming to interact with the the or to coming to to before the CBA. I, I I personally don't don't want to do it. I hear what you're saying. 
Ms. Marshall. Is there any precedent in any of the various fees that the town charges um, for a, a hardship waiver or reduction? I mean, I, I don't know what kind of application someone would be making, you know, if they could afford to do whatever the work is, but $300 is, I, I mean, I don't know if there are some um, applications that are may, maybe for like paper, paper changes and don't involve any actual construction of something. And in which case $300 might be a lot of money. You know, if you're, if you're undertaking a $10,000 project, it's, it's pretty small. So I, but again, is there any kind of hardship system? Well, we do have, uh, Maureen is showing us that there are additional fees that are based upon types of of um, their impact upon the community. So um, these are their high impact or their impact fees that are scaled based upon um, the type of, of project it is. And they range from $500 to $50, depending upon the, um, the, fair, the nature of the applicant. Um, so there is some, if it's not a hardship, it's not exactly applicable to your question, but it does show that there is a, for us and the, and the um, ZBA, there is a, and I don't know, Maureen, if this is only, if this is for the whole town or if this is just ZBA fees, um, there is a differential. There's a, a sliding scale already in effect that we may be able to work off of um, to come up with some um, more um, graduated, a scale, a scalable fee structure that we could use this as a starting point. Um. So, uh, yeah. Mr. Judge, uh, so yeah, these fees as shown on the screen are only fees um, relative to ZBA applications. Yeah. Um, to perhaps this, uh, um, hopefully, hopefully I'm answering Ms. Marshall's question. Um, the board, so from time to time, there are applicants that uh, will state that they are, have a financial hardship, um, and that they ask that the board consider uh, reducing their application fee or waiving it entirely. Um, and so there is a process for that. They would have to um, submit a, a request to the ZBA. Um, so it would be to your discretion to approve, um, approve um, an application like a uh, reduction or, or a waiver. Um, but these are the impact fees. So starting at the top, a high impact fee for non-residential is for $500. And those are related to sort of institutional uses, government and public service uses and research and industrial uses. And then um, um, and then there's uh, sort of higher in, uh, for residential, it's $300 plus $50 per dwelling unit for residential uses that have more than six uh, dwelling units. And then there's a moderate impact um, use of $300 for non-residential and then $150 plus $50 per dwelling unit for, for six dwellings or less. And then for owner-occupied properties, um, it's a low impact fee of $50. Uh, so um, you know, if there's an owner-occupied family that wants to put an ADU or a fence or a sign, um, that fee would be fifty dollars. They still would have to play the legal ad because the because um, um, a because there is a legal ad that's a requirement under Mass General Law, and the Gazette will you know is charging on average about five hundred dollars, um, and so we're asking to increase the fee from seventy five dollars to three hundred dollars to offset the the cost of the bill um, to the Gazette. Um, because someone does need to pay for that. Um, so un unfortunately, the, I guess the, the real part of this is, is it should be the applicant or should it be the town of Amherst paying for the legal ads for applicants on their behalf? So if we look at tonight, tonight we had three issues. We got uh, $225 in fees for the legal uh, costs, and I don't know what it is, but let's say that it's $500, the average. 
That's fifteen hundred dollars the cost of this town. It's offset by two hundred and twenty-five dollars with, with fees from the applicants. Um, I think that that means that there's there's a significant loss to the town, and I think we should be looking at a way to try to reduce that. And I know that you also want to do that too, Mr. Max Maxfield. We may disagree on exactly how we want to do it, but but I think that if that happens every week, that adds up. You know, that's that adds up and um, and it means that it adds up for taxpayers. So what I'd like to do is, I feel like we had a good discussion about this. I want to set, you know, uh, separate this issue from the rest of the changes to the um, the rules and regulations, and, and split the split the question, and have the rest of the, the rules and regulations modifications approved or 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 uh, defeated, and then come back and discuss this separately and make a decision on what we want to do just so we don't get the two things confused i think they're separate the other ones seem to me to be all um pretty much um just non-conforming changes except for this one that she sh that maureen has up right now which i i referred to which clarifies when you need four votes for approval of a change to an existing um, special permit or or a comprehensive permit needs three or um a requirement for a public meeting on matters of other things uh, that doesn't require a, a public hearing. You need three votes, not f not four. So for the final uh, approval of that motion before the body, that's that is just restating what we, we we should be doing anyway. But it makes it clear and it makes it in the rules. I don't think there's anything else in here that of the, aside from the fees that are controversial um, or raise any questions that I would. I think need to be brought to the to your attention, and I've gone through them uh, with Maureen today. It looks like Craig has raised his hand. Yes, Mr. Meadows. There is one other that I was. I have a question about that was in two point one four, um, where it calls for. I'll wait until you get there. Yes. Oh, it's 2.14. 2.14, sorry. Yep. Oh, uh, 2.14 uh, calls for a unanimous vote. 2.14? Um, yes, I think it's two. In the absence of any appearance without the due cause, on behalf of the board may act, uh, et cetera, board may decide by unanimous vote that the petition. Now, everything else we're doing by a simple majority three or four why is this a unanimous vote the absence of any appearance without due cause on behalf of the applicant whoops sorry i'm just sorry i just want to see the title um applicant may present an application for the You know, that looks to me like that's a holdover from the three. I'm guessing this morning that that's the holdover from the requirement that all decisions be made by the by a three member ZBA had to be unanimous. Because because this says that when somebody doesn't show up, we can deny or continue it, but it would. Uh, so I will say that. Um... Well, let's let's let me think on that. Um, I will say the twenty twenty two. Um, uh, rules and regs um, was carefully reviewed by Attorney John Witten. Yes. So I, I feel pretty confident that that language um, works. But uh, let's. Um, Let's think about that, um, and I, I'll get back to you um, in a few minutes. I want to look something up just to double check. And if can we possibly? I understand the motivation for for splitting up the vote, um, and yet at the same time, it seems as though we need to take action on mm -hmm. everything tonight. 
Um, and I, I understand what Dylan is, is suggesting. And it, 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 it is reasonable to consider that, but I think what we need to do is, is uh, vote to make the changes that are in here, including uh, Part B, um, and give the chair the authority to go and negotiate with the planning board. Uh, on and set a, a date for a follow-up meeting on these things again in the fall. Is that reasonable? It is. And is that a motion, Mr. Meadows? It is. Is there a second? I'll second. You know, Miss Marshall, I'm. I hate to say this to you, but oh, uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you can observe, thought, you can talk, but you can't vote and you can't second. Oh, I thought I could on this one. I beg your pardon. Uh, no, not on this one. Not on the rules of rights. Um, I will say that the planning department strongly encourages the ZBA to consider approving the the legal ad increase tonight, um, as we are financially having difficulty um, paying for these um, applications um, and there's a lot coming in. Um, I'll second that motion. So we have before us a motion from Mr. Meadows that we approve the, the changes as, that appear here from the staff that we move to $300 as the um, legal advertisement fee that we empower the chair, we authorize the chair, instruct the chair to go out and try to harmonize with the planning board and that we report back, let's say by the, um, it's gonna to be tough to do it in a month, let's say we report back by October 15th to the committee with a um, report on what we're trying to do for a harmonized and perhaps bifurcated uh, fee structure. Is that, that, is that the correct um, summary of your motion, Mr. Meadows? Yes, it is. That motion is made and seconded. Um, discussion of that motion. Mr. Maxfield. All right. Uh, I don't want to bog us down, so I figure what I'll do. I'll just propose an amendment to the motion. If we like it, we'll vote for it. If not, we'll get shot down and we'll all move on with our nights. Um, the only amendment I want to make to that is to raise that it will be raising the fees from 75 to 200 on, I believe, what was already defined as high and moderate impact. Am I correct about that, Maureen? Was that, was that the title for the two of those? Um, uh, so, no, I'm sorry, say that again. Um, uh, we have it defined as the, the different types of applications where we'll charge 500 for a high impact. And, yeah, yep. But, um, so yeah, that the fee, the fee will be raised from, 300, uh, from 75 to 300 for high and the moderate impact while remaining 75 for low impact. That's that's my amendment that I'm I'm moving. If anybody likes it, let's see what we got. All right. Amendment is made. Is there a second to the amendment? Second. All right, Ms. Parks. <laughs> seconds the motion. So now we have an amendment to this, as, as stated by Mr. Maxfield. Is there further discussion? I would say one thing quickly. Um, I like the notion. I like that the concept, and I hope that's where we get. My goal would be to have as much flexibility going in and talking to the planning board, maybe coming up and not have something we already did that we have to undo. Uh, I just think it gives us more flexibility to try to come up with a, 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 a scale of some sort and gives me a, and gives us more flexibility to talk to them. So I think we, I think we'll probably get to something like you want, Mr. Maxfield, but I would just prefer to have more flexibility to, to negotiate with the town, the planning department and the planning board than coming in with a, a proposal of a bifurcated um, fee structure already. That's that's my feeling on that. Any other comments about that motion, about the amendment to the motion? If not, the vote occur, Mr. Max, Maxwell, do you wanna say something? Nope. If not the vote, if there's no further comments, the vote occurs on the amendment to the motion. 
Um, it's a roll call vote. The chair votes no. Ms. Parks? No. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? No. Mr. Gilbert? No. Nope. Right. So the amendment is defeated. Um, the, the question occurred, the, now we return to the original motion by Mr. Meadows. Is there any further discussion on Mr. Meadows' amendment, Mr. Meadows' motion? If not, the motion before the body is to approve the rules with the $300 fee. Uh, the changes to the rules with the $300 fees. And I would add a friendly amendment if you accept, which is to authorize the staff to make technical and conforming changes if we find um, grammatical or misprints. And sometimes that happens. So with that friendly amendment, um, if Mr. Meadows agrees, uh, I put the question to the body. It's a roll call vote. The chair votes aye on the motion. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? I assume my vote isn't needed for this to pass, so <laughs> no. I will vote no on this one. You can vote. We only need three. This is a good clarification. We only need three votes on this. Mr. Meadows? Aye. And Mr. Gilbert? Aye. All right. So with that, the rules are approved. I will get in touch with the planning board as well as the planning staff. I'll try to have some kind of a discussion with them and report back as quickly as possible, but certainly not, um, certainly before October 15th or our, our meeting in October, our second meeting in October, whenever that is. Great. I don't think there's any other business before us except for public comment uh, on matters which are not before the board tonight. And do we have anybody, any attendees that wish to speak? Doesn't look not. And do we have any new business, uh, other, other business before the board not noticed in the last 48 hours? I guess the one we would have is Maureen, when is our next meeting and what's? Uh, I think it's, let me double check. Uh, it should be <laughs> Thursday, September 8th. And we have an, we have items for the agenda already. We do so. Um, South Point, which is called Renew Amherst, located at perhaps two sixty six East Hadley Road, they need to amend their previously approved special permit for a variety of different items and conditions, and so that's a public hearing. And there may be a public meeting. Um, but I'm unsure of that. Okay. Um, so. All right. We have that one. Okay. Is there any other new business from any members of the board? We're going to get done just before nine o'clock, which was our goal. Things speed up between eight forty-five and nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a clock, and we're going to start this at about eight o'clock at night. We're going to be at eight forty-five, and things are going to go really fast from now on. All right, folks, thank you very much for all your effort and work and your hours put into this. I appreciate it. We all appreciate it. And I hope you have a great end of the summer and we'll see each other in a couple of weeks. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you. See you later.